Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the greatest professional wrestler of all time, your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, Conrad, I just got two words for you today. Roll Tide. <laughs> I am so glad you did that so I didn't have to. I can't believe this is a real sentence. Alabama's in the final four, and we talked about it last week, and you got a little sore at me that when I was oh. rattling off who might win, I said, could it be this team? Could it be that team? Could it be this team? And you're like, you didn't mention my volunteers. They got robbed. I mean, you talk about it was a, 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 a look. There was. Earl Hebner was refereeing on one end of the court and Dave Hebner was refereeing on the other end of the court. Earl being the evil twin, he was screwing my Tennessee volunteers. And on the other end, I mean, they gave Purdue. No, I don't want to cry over it. Hey, March Madness is legit. And for you international fans out there that don't have a clue what March Madness is, it is a month-long college basketball tournament. It starts with, I guess you could say 64 teams, but really, I guess it's 68. And I think they're going to go to 72, but it's a month long tournament and it's a uh, Cinderella story, surprises, ups and downs. And, you know, my favorite college basketball team or second favorite, uh, you know, roll tide. I've always been a big Alabama supporter, uh, no matter what sport it is. No, Conrad, they are in the final four. What a, and the girls tournament is awesome. Uh, no, it's been a lot of fun. And they were talking about the ratings back to, uh, get into business, Conrad, um, the ratings this year, um, wow. They just keep growing and growing and growing. And they were talking about, uh, on uh, Twitter that Super Bowl set a record, uh, all the different sports are just setting records and viewership records and ratings records and demo records. And then it gets to the NBA, and the NBA has not set the records, but college basketball certainly has. So a lot of fun. Congrats to your Crimson Tide. All the world will be pulling for them. Uh, but, you know, Conrad, as I watched it, uh, I was thinking, all right, Alabama is going to be the Cinderella story, and who snuck in the back door? NC State. So I think they are definitely um, – even bigger Cinderella story than, than the tide, but uh, a lot of fun to watch that. Um, who would have thought Connie Alabama's a football school? Well, maybe not anymore. We'll see. How about that? The college football playoff and then the final four just a yeah. couple of months later, that's pretty wild. And it's got me, uh, kind of jammed up because Saturday is going to be a crazy day in my life, Jeff. Oh boy. Our pal, our great close personal friend, Cassio kid, friend of the show. Oh yes. He is the number one. He's on the number one morning show in all of North Alabama. For you. Cassio and rocket 95.1 here in North Alabama. And they're actually introducing and hosting a ZC top and Leonard Skinner concert on Saturday night. Get out of here. That's the same night. Wait, 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 wait. At this, this Saturday night at the Von Braun Civic Center here in Huntsville, Alabama, that's what's going down. In the middle of that concert, Alabama will tip off against UConn in the playoff, and Cody Rhodes will tag up with Seth Rollins to take on Roman Reigns and The Rock. That all happens this Saturday, Jeff. A lot of stuff going on in my I'm life. I'm going to guess time. you're not going to be out on the pontoon this weekend. Like, I think it's going to be too damn cold. Oh, okay. Well, it's a beautiful weekend here in Nashville. So. Well, let me just say this. We are, uh, there's more to life than just WrestleMania. Of course, over on the other channel, AEWTIX.com. We are on the way to dynasty. Ooh, boy. Put your phone down when you're on the road. And I got to tell you, it's easy to get distracted when you see marquee matchups like Will Ospreay. And Brian Danielson, my goodness, what a barn burner that's going to be. But we see them every day. People driving, using their phones. There's the sneak a peeker or the fast scroller who can quickly become the fender benderer, the got a ticketer, or the driver who killed someone. 
put the phone away or pay paid for by NHTSA. Of course, uh, man, there's so much going on in wrestling right now. It feels like there's a lot of, uh, basically everything is happening this weekend. I mean, there's, there's a big ring of honor pay-per-view. Mark Briscoe is going to be getting a shot at the world title in just a few weeks. We've got AEW dynasty on tap, not one, but two nights of WrestleMania. The Monday night after WrestleMania is always big. WrestleCon always has a big super show. Like everybody in the wrestling space is on heightened alert for like the next 10 days or so. Really just the whole month of April. Does that sound about right to you, Jeff? You know, Conrad, yes. And uh, to dive into my world, not pardon the pun, when I first broke into the business and the territory days, this was a quote unquote summer territory. And the first education I got about, oh yeah, because best business that we did in, in our seven state territory area here was from the time school got out to the sky school went back in and we would run Sundays and certainly Thursdays, Fridays all through the year, but all those weekend shows would pick up. And then of course, uh, kids could stay out later and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday uh, was a bigger deal, but yeah, we were summer territory, but hearing the different areas around the world, around the country that were um, basically not summer territories. And that's when it would be down the farther North you go, you know, you didn't run uh, the summer in Canada, um, the Northeast, uh, all, all, you know, wasn't as good. They used to do the Cape Cod tour up in uh, the Northeast, but yes, uh, once January rolls around, just like it mirrors the television season, January, February, March, and the beginning of April is just when the, uh, you know, this is old school talking. Uh, that's when all the, uh, finales on whatever kind of TV show you, you like to watch. Uh, but it, you know, it was the end of the TV season and that's kind of my understanding, uh, why the WWF at the time landed on less place, WrestleMania, WrestleMania, right at the end of the TV season. And it's now kind of morphed into the month of April, uh, is the man, all, all kinds of, uh, opportunities out there for a wrestling fan. And, um, you know, TNA, we, we did lockdown, which is kind of our counter programming to WrestleMania and, and the growth of AEW revolution in, um, in March. And now for the first time ever, we have our April pay-per-view. So pretty cool dynasty. And, um, I'm not one of those match of the year guys, but Conrad, it is already kind of, uh, penciled in, in a lot of folks books, Danielson, Osprey, St. Louis, traditional wrestling market. Uh, it's going to be a match for the ages. I've said it many, many times. I think Di Brian Danielson is the, best current uh he's the modern day best storyteller in the ring and i think osprey as we said a couple of weeks ago his athletic ability um takes him up a notch above everybody else he's faster he's quicker he's stronger uh some guys probably don't want to admit that but uh, danielson osprey dynasty in st louis will be one for the ages i can't wait tickets are on sale now awtix.com and of course shoes baseball right around the corner i know uh you got some big plans and you guys have got a whole bunch of unique nights you know it, it's more than just baseball it's an event it's a happening and there's lots of shoulder events that are going to be happening around that and some special celebrations and uh, you might see some of your favorite wwe superstars or hall of famers or legends of the squared circle at some of these games stay tuned i'm sure we'll have more announcements in the coming weeks on that and the rumor in innuendo is that you may or may not have a big announcement next week but i don't want to give too much away but i do want to go ahead and give away the idea that we're doing poll questions over on our youtube mm -hmm. we're going to actually throw you guys the keys to the castle here you're going to be in the driver's seat and the only way to vote in the poll is not on twitter it's not on Instagram. It's not on Facebook. It's our YouTube. That's my world on youtube.com. And, uh, our subscribers had these questions as far as, you know, what, what are we looking for here? What's your favorite version of double J the WCW slap nut era, AEW, the last outlaw WWE. Don't piss me off. And the WWF greatest country singer of all time. Slap nut won 40% of the vote here, Jeff, as far as the va favorite version 
of the double J character. Are you surprised by that? That slap nut got 40%. And that's of the double J character. It's not the King of the mountain and, and all that. And I was, it was curious to that the last outlaw was put in there, but we are having a blast over on my world on YouTube. So it kind of didn't all the guitar shots. Uh, we just talked earlier about moments and, uh, before we started rolling, um, you know, whether it's a, a match, a moment or a promo, uh, a lot of double J moments, if you will, Beetlejuice, Gary Coleman, lots of fun stuff. <laughs> it's funny you say that because we asked what was the greatest smash hit of your career of all the people oh. who took some of those guitar necklaces, like somebody across the pond who we agreed, we did a pinky promise beforehand. We're not talking about him today, oh. but, but you actually nailed it. Because when we asked fans on our YouTube over on uh, my world on youtube.com, who's the greatest smash hit? Is it Gary Coleman? Is it Kurt Angle? Is it Gold Dust? Is it Beetlejuice? And Beetlejuice won. It was a runaway 62%. You know, as you are, I mean, you've hit so many people with guitars over the years, including ladies, by the way. Yes. And the elderly. Uh, you. You you got the the Beetlejuice rub maybe more than any other on the YouTube poll. Is that the the shot that people bring up to you out in the wild more than any other? Uh, so uh, we'll call it folks that are you know I'll call it <clears throat> more than casual watch. I'll, I don't want to say a hardcore fan, but a real wrestling fan will always gravitate toward uh, well the non wrestling fan by far Beetlejuice. It's like that thing has made memes and and it's it's made the it has definitely made the rounds uh, on all kinds of non wrestling. It's on. It's all over TikTok. Uh, there's all kind of stuff like that. So non wrestling fans, it's Beetlejuice. Wrestling fans, Conrad, you know a lot of people remember. They were like, we could not believe it. I remember when I was watching. Da 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 da. They can fill in the blanks. Fabulous Moolah. That that shock that that came out of the blue. Um, so so the 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 wrestling fan. I would say it's Mula and it's, it's, it's one at one and one a so Mula and Beetlejuice. That's so fun to me. <laughs> we, uh, we also asked what's the greatest version of Jeff Jarrett in TNA on these polls. And we threw up planet Jarrett, immortal Jarrett, NWA champion in the asylum Jarrett and MMA Jarrett <laughs> and NWA champion got 52%. Listen, I thought they were nailing it so far, but. Come on, MMA Jarrett. That's the one. <laughs> oh, that vignette. Mr. Borash did a hell of an edit job. And uh, the three uh, friends of the family, now they're in college age. <laughs> I'm sure that is uh, maybe passed around a few college parties. Uh, let me watch Jeff Jarrett put a ankle locks up. No, a lot of fun. MMA Jarrett. I, I retired undefeated, Conrad. I know you know that. So. Well, of course. I mean, you're going to retire undefeated in professional wrestling, too. I mean, I have it on good authority that the only time that you've been counted three is with a shady referee. Yep. Like that name, Aubrey Edwards. We know that she's on the take. Yep. She's just, you know, a terrible human being. A even worse referee. Just the worst. To her core. Yes. Rotten. And when they cheated, I mean, because nobody's ever beat you fair and square. I mean, I know that for a fact, uh, the, op the options on the poll right now, we'd love to hear your vote. Y you know, we want to hear from you. What was your favorite stable in TNA planet? Jarrett immortal Kings of wrestling or frontline. you also be able to vote on topics and so much more over at my world on youtube.com. And I want to give a heads up before we get going into our topic today, because we are going to be talking about WrestleMania 15. I can't believe this is real 25 years later and in the same city, Philadelphia. But before we get into that, I want to give a little programming note. Uh, collision is late night this week, as I understand it. So if you happen to be watching WrestleMania and then when WrestleMania is finished, you just flip it over, bam. You'll be able to watch a little collision on Saturday night. A lot of wrestling going down on Saturday night, right, Jeff? Unbelievable amount. It, you know, and that's the cool part of, um, I don't know if you got a chance to see the CMLL show on Friday. I missed it. Well, I mean, not, not, not see it, hear about it. Um, the AEW contingent was down there. Brian Danielson and others had a 
hell of a travel travel day. They were at, in uh, Arena Mexico, sold out on Friday night, uh, and then we're in London, Ontario, Canada uh, on Saturday, Friday, and then flew up there Saturday. So a uh, couple of time zones later, lots of travel. You never get out of the building early in Mexico. So um, just CMLL, AAA, New Japan, um, just shows all over the place. Obviously, uh, TNA, uh, I think they've got a big one coming up. But then you just get into the big two and think about the massive amount of content that last Saturday night in London. Uh, Conrad, a hell of a crowd. They were going crazy. You know, for us, uh, AEW to bring a uh, collision uh, to that market uh, was a, a big coup, I'll say, from the city of London. And a lot went into bringing the show there. And then, as you just said, rolling into this weekend. Gosh, uh, the other the, the, it brings me back to Dallas, Conrad, when we were out doing that uh, that show we did and how many different wrestling, you know, there's probably 20, 30 wrestling shows uh, around Philadelphia this weekend, uh, but obviously Mania, uh, two nights, Ring of Honor pay-per-view on Friday night, old uh, stomping grounds of ROH in a lot of ways. So it's that time of year, pal. It is that time of year. So real quick, one more time. It's this Saturday night collision, not the normal time, 1130 Eastern. So you can have wrestling all night, man. If you're watching the other show during the day, no big deal. Flip it over. 1130 is when collision starts this weekend. I'll give a shout out. We've got a, a pretty big ROH uh, title match this weekend too. Yeah. Uh, Mark Briscoe. There you go. And Eddie Kingston. And what's crazy about that. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go out of your way to see the Mark Briscoe video and vignette where he's talking about his brother, Jay, and he's talking about what this title shot means. And he's talking about how much he's looking forward to challenging Eddie Kingston, but Mark Briscoe's challenging for the ring of honor world title 11 years to the day from when his brother Jay won that world title 11 years to the day. I mean, some things are just meant to be think the world, Eddie Kingston and Mark Briscoe really looking forward to that one. Just a lot of great wrestling happening this weekend. Of course, that Ring of Honor pay-per-view happens on Friday night. And uh, as you know, as, as, as folks are listening to this, Raw last night was high five. But if I had to pick a show on Friday night, uh, throw me some of that Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Hey, speaking of uh, getting ready, okay. normally when you get ready for this show, yep. you put on a My World shirt. But as I'm looking at you today, and eventually Marcus will put you full screen here so people can see, you're not wearing a My World shirt. It's no, just, not. it's a not, I mean, it fits you nice. It looks great, but it's just a black t shirt. It's, it doesn't have your face on it. What's up with that? It is not just a black t shirt. Okay. This is Mac Weldon. Um, all kidding aside, pal. Um, as you know, a lot of chatter. Our man, Dave Green. And the brains at ad free shows and podcast heat. And, um, we have talked uh, a little bit off and on through the last couple of years and, uh, we finally landed on it. So I am, uh, living, breathing billboard from Mac Weldon. No, the show, the shirt that I have on, um, I'll, I'll let you get into all the details about the cotton and the patented feel and all that, but there's really just one word. It's it, um, uh, when the last at law, suits up and shows up you got to have some confidence and this is what this this is kind of what their brand's all about uh but i know i love the shirt it's comfy um it is it is right up my alley i uh wear black uh often and uh it, the, the comfort and the fit i can't say enough good things about it but uh confident uh, is the word that probably uh because that's what folks said hey man you got to kind of drill this down into a few words. Uh, and I said, okay, confidence shirt, uh, is a great fit and I don't like baggy stuff and all that kind of stuff. So nice shirt, Connie. Well, listen, it's like, um, you can't have it both ways, right? A lot of times in life, it's not like, like you want to eat better, but you also want a cheeseburger, but there's no such thing as a cheeseburger, you know, with zero calories and guys tend to think that looking sharp means that you've got a, you know, have a starched up Oxford and you got to have some stiff chinos and you can't really have effortless comfort and look sharp. Well, that is until you find out about Mack Weldon. What Mack Weldon does is make timeless apparel 
with modern performance fabrics for guys who want to look and feel sharp without sacrificing comfort. From their light as air underwear to their innovative anti-odor tees and their versatile yet comfortable pants, Mack Weldon has a full range of clothes that really just never go out of style. And you saw Jeff bragging about it, but man, the shirt fits him great. And it gives you that extra confidence. You just, if you, if you feel like you look good, you're going to be more productive. You're going to be more effective. I mean, we've even heard in business, a lot of times people say dress for the job you want. And I can tell you in sales, it is something you hear guys talk about a lot that when they dress better, they feel better. And that confidence comes through and they're more successful. Man, Mack Weldon is like a life hack in that regard. And some guys, you know, just want to look good without calling attentions to themselves. That Everybody doesn't want the Bruce Pritchard special with the crazy shirts. Mack Weldon gives you understated good looks for understated confidence. It's nothing flashy. It's just classic stuff that's always in style. And it's made from the most comfortable performance materials. And we should mention this is really like performance fabric. And usually that means clothes that feel techy or maybe they have that shiny shimmer, but Mac Wilden, Mac Weldon, rather all their clothes are designed to fit your style and the demands of modern life. You see, they look like regular clothes, but they've got all the latest in modern comfort. So nobody's going to know it's also your most comfortable shirt. Wouldn't that be nice if it was your most comfortable shirt and the shirt that looked best on you. That's what Mac Weldon's all about. And they've got, the breathable underwear, it's going to keep you cool, dry, and comfy all day. It's air knit underwear, y'all. They've got crazy comfortable but elevated sweatpants as part of their Ace collection. You can even get upgraded polos with antimicrobial silver threads, which means no gross odors. It's going to stay cleaner longer. And an ultra soft antimicrobial tee for exactly what I just said. When you need to stay fresher, longer, Mack Weldon can hook you up. Get these timeless looks with modern comfort from our friends at Mack Weldon. Go right now to MacWeldon.com. Get 20% off your first order. And be sure to use our promo code MYWORLD. That's M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N.com. And the promo code is MYWORLD. MacWeldon.com. And the promo code is MYWORLD. Jeff, uh, let's talk about it, man. WrestleMania. Big week for wrestling fans, whether you're an AEW fan, a WWE fan, a AAA fan, a CMLA fan, whatever. Everybody talks about WrestleMania this time of year. And we're talking about WrestleMania from 25 years ago. And as luck would have it, and as we come into 1999, you and Owen Hart become a tag team. How did, how do you guys get paired together originally as best you can recall? You know, that is actually, I wish I had like the aha moment or excuse me, how it all came together, but you really have to go back. Context is king. When the, I'll just call it the attitude, attitude era got rolling and the, the programming uh, of raw, um, or, you know, raw and nitro, you know, the, especially raw, they had, we'll call it the Austin thread. Um, and then for a while it was the Austin thread and the DX thread, but, but, but a lot of times it was the Austin McMahon thread. And then a lot of, I don't want to say just shock TV, but as we get into this sec, uh, th this episode and kind of, you'll kind of shout out some match times. It was really, um, the first time. I can't say the first time, but, you know, enhancement matches would go two or three minutes. But when you ever put a competitive match on TV, for the most part, and I know Nitro was doing maybe seven or eight minute matches uh, for, for competitive. But, man, these segments were so quick and there was so much turnover and there were the outlandish characters. We're going to talk about public entity enemy today. We're going to talk about I mean, we're right in the. Conrad, you know this better than I do, but wouldn't you say 98 was the just the uh, apex of the Attitude Era uh, as far as it just a rocket? Everything was going on. There were so many different things going on. And it just kind of how the, the, the dominoes fell that I was having a singles career and coming out of, uh, you know, the, the Robert uh, Fuller, set of circumstances, the Aztec Indian and Owen kind of the same thing. He had been paired and different things. And all of a sudden they had an idea to put us together. 
and me and Owen, I, I do remember we were both like, hell yeah, this will be fantastic. Let's go for it. And it just kind of fell into place, but there wasn't any grand master plan at all. You, uh, you guys eventually get put together as a, a tag team here. Uh, how was he feeling about being in a tag team? I mean, I know once upon a time he's had a few different tag team iterations. I mean, great run with bulldog once upon a time, even with Coco beware, uh, he had spent more time as a tag team wrestler than probably you had. Oh yeah. Did you, did you enjoy working as a tag? I mean, did Owen enjoy tagging with you? Just talk to me about your tag team experience because this is really, and I know we talked about before you know, when you were in Memphis with your boy, Travis and all that, but in the big time in the WWF, you hadn't really been a tag team wrestler. I'd Talk never been a that. tag team wrestler that you would, I was never a tag team wrestler and Owen. Yes, he was team with Coco and uh bulldog, but they were basically two singles coming together. It was never like a Marty and Sean or uh, the bushwhackers. And just, uh, we could come up with all kinds of tag teams. Me and Owen were, without question, two singles guys coming together with our own identity and, and everything that went with it. But we, you know, like you said, I had been in all kinds of tags and six bands my whole career, but I had never worked as a tag team. And when the idea came about and me and Owen kind of looked at the roster top to bottom and looked at the teams and we knew DX uh, what was right at the top. And there was multiple other teams. There were also some some youth coming up the hardys were had had transitioned into they were i don't i don't know exactly what year but they were certainly uh full time and and um the brood uh ha, ha, was coming along anyway there was a lot of tag teams being developed and me and owen knew that um from the heel side of things there was going to be a lot of opportunity um and it it just it, for lack of a better word thing we knew before we got together that it would click. It's, uh, it's one of those tag teams that I think sometimes people forget about because there was so much happening in this era. And it's not like it was a, a tag team that lasted for years or anything like that, but I would have loved to have seen what you guys could do together because I thought you complimented each other really, really well. Was there something that took getting used to that you wouldn't have expected when you're trying to transition from being singles to a tag, like just as far as the way you put together a match and the way you work it and all that stuff, because you had really been just driving the lane as a singles wrestler for so long. Was and, there an adjustment period for you? So I don't want to call it adjustment, but I think both of us went into it. I'll say certainly I did. <clears throat> no, we both did because during this time frame. <clears throat> you knew right up front, nothing lasted forever. So down to the gear, all right? Do we get like really matching gear and do we come yes. up with a name? Do, 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 do we make that transition or do we keep two singles and Russo and Ferrara, you know, and, and, and the agents, nobody had any of those answers. It was all, you know, at the end of the day, what Vince wanted to do. Uh, and, and we knew that could change at any minute, at any time. And also, you know, the realities of injuries and pivots and everything that went with it. So we didn't know how long it was going to last. That was probably the most uncertainty. I will say this up at the top of this episode, as I look on it today in 2024, knowing that, you know, his passing, this is January when we got put together. Um, he passed away uh, very unfortunately in May, you know, just five months later. Had not the accident not have happened, I could have seen, I could definitely see a scenario where we would have become tags and and then not really split up, gone into singles and come back as tags. Also think ultimately there would have been the, the right story and the right program where we would have split up as a team. And I think I would have been the heel, obviously, and, and Owen the baby face. And I think an Owen Jeff singles uh storyline would have would have been very intriguing we just had natural chemistry both second generation wrestlers jim ross and others always would commentate you know as much as they or were allowed to it's one of those things that it wrote itself and i think that's why 
hey, I was so fired up to do this episode because when I look back on my career, Conrad, these five months, and yes, the business was red hot, selling out everywhere, fun in the ring, fun on the road. It was a, a, a real highlight of my career from a personal point of view that, um, you know, co coming out of uh, just a, a crappy situation um, and I guess you could say getting things back on track uh, in my career, it was, uh, I was having a blast and, and working, definitely working my butt off. Just as a reminder, we're getting knee deep in the attitude era. As we're ending 1998, we've got the undertaker putting stone cold on a <clears throat> symbol. We've also got Mark Henry grabbing, uh, a gimmick on a person he thought was a lady. And there's all sorts of weird stuff going on here that we would never see in, tra in a traditional wrestling show. When you think back on the attitude era, I mean, listen, for whatever reason, a lot of the internet wrestling community and a lot of legends within the business would always say, Oh, that's that Memphis crap. And talk about the stuff that your dad and Jerry Lawler had booked. <laughs> Meanwhile, boy, we're booking some crazy outrageous stuff here that Jerry Lawler never dreamed of booking in Memphis. Um, what did you think? And, and more importantly, what did your dad think of, of how maybe over the line or pushing the envelope, the attitude era was? Oh boy. This may be, uh, I, I, I'm going to not get long winded here, but Conrad talk about a, a real education that I received because, you know, as a kid, um, growing up in the environment, you know, you go to the wrestling matches and around the wrestling fans and everything that went along with that wrestling was, was cool, but uh, you know, the schools that I went to, uh, you know, yeah, it was, I don't say a four letter word, but it was certainly kind of looked down on it, it. It was, you know, as nothing anywhere close to mainstream. And it was a niche of a niche back then. And then you transition into, um, we'll just kind of call it the Monday night raw as you know, the new generation era. And it was all Monday nights and the exposure began to grow and grow and grow. And, and it, you know, looked upon more as entertainment, um, not that wrestling stuff, if you will. And then all of a sudden, what you just said, the attitude era exploded Monday night nitro was on, uh, that, that storyline Hulk Hogan and Hall and Nash and everything that went with it. And then the shock jock stuff started happening and it was very, very interesting for me, Conrad. I'll, I'll say this. I had wrestled obviously my entire life. My dad, you know, promoted my grandmother promoted and you, you kind of just the ebb and flow of it, but I had folks in my community, Conrad, um, I, and I don't want to say this too negatively, but I'll just say there were some church going folks. Yes. that really took offense to so many things. I mean, and I, back in this day, I kind of, I took offense to them taking offense. And I said, now, wait a minute. You do understand that the cat's out of the bag and we are uh, just like Hollywood, but we're not, we're action and we're entertainment but it became a real lesson that took me a while for it to sink in is that people are going to believe what they want to believe, but yes, we're not true sport, but we dang sure ain't true. Just entertainment in the eyes of the public. We're, we're just, we're that hybrid. I think that's part of the secret sauce. I think that's why a Mike Tyson or a Logan Paul or, or you name it, any of these celebrities that want to get into our business because it's so unique but the attitude era, like just exposed the world to all kinds of things. And when you saw a Godfather or a Val Venus or anything, you know, that storyline between, uh, Taker and Austin, uh, rock and, and, um, mankind's brutal match that we're going to just touch on here in a little bit. There was all kinds of things that people that had not been exposed to the attitude era that remember their wrestling 
the territory days, whatever part of the country they grew up in, when they juxtapose the territory days to all of a sudden they hadn't watched it in 15 years. And maybe, maybe they had heard about WrestleMania and Rocky and the Hulk, Hulk movie. And maybe they had heard of, that's what I'm saying. Maybe a clash at the champions on TBS, just a sprinkling. But when they went from territory wrestling to attitude, it was so different. They got offended and they would let me know about it from time to time. And Conrad, I would, uh, a, a lot of folks, depending upon who they were, I'm saying, now you going to judge me. Or are you going to judge that dude that walks in church who we know is on his fifth marriage? You know, those kind of things. It, 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 it became a, a very eye opening uh, education for myself. Well, here's a little education we could all use. I mean, here's the reality. Life doesn't happen bi-weekly. So why should payday? The money you can earn can be in your hands today with earn in. Earn in is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to hundred dollars per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the earn in app and verify your paycheck, then access up to hundred dollars a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. This is a big deal. If you're trying to put together a, a special night out with the lady. Maybe you've got a last minute gift need for a loved one, or maybe it's something not so awesome, like an unexpected last minute trip to the vet, or maybe you're a little short on rent day, or maybe it's time for a new dress or new school or new shoes, whatever. Make earn in a part of your financial routine and join earn ins over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about earn in, I think about financial stability, security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. That's what earn in is all about. They're going to help you get that peace of mind and, uh, not make you just worry and stress about how many more days until payday download earn in today. That's spelled E A R N I N in the Google play or Apple app store. When you download the earn in app, type in my world under podcast. When you sign up, it'll really help the show. That's my world under podcast. Earn in is a financial, a financial tech company, not a bank. This is subject to your available earnings, daily max pay period, max and location. See earnin.com slash T O S for details. Bank products are issued by evolve bank and trust member FDIC. Boy, you know, that makes me think about earn in right there, Jeff, back in the day, wrestlers used to call that a draw, right? <laughs> That's right, pal. You think uh, Ric Flair ever got any draws in his day? If you oh, had to guess, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Earn oh. in is the wrestling equivalent of a draw. Check it out and be sure to type in or look for my world under podcast. When you sign up, it really helps the show and it'll help you get to the next payday. That's E A R N I N in the Google or Apple app store. My world under podcast. When you sign up, love it. Love it. So listen, your first tag match together with Owen is against the new age outlaws. It happens on January 11th on raw is war from Houston. You defeat them. And that makes you guys in your first time teaming together. Number one contenders for the tag straps. Now that sounds like a cool deal until you realize, well, tag team wrestling was not exactly priority for the WWF in this era. I've kind of thought over the years. I know they had a hot period. We'll call it the late eighties and the very early nineties where it felt like they were just loaded with great tag teams, like the rockers, like the heart foundation, like the bulldogs, like demolition, like the road warriors or the legion of doom as they were known. I mean, but even more fun acts like the bushwhackers. And I mean, there were so many great tag teams through the years, but then it felt like for a long time, it just wasn't a priority. Do you think that was because during the, the lull or the downtime of the WWF, because the new generation area were really some lean times or do you think that was just a cost cutting measure for Vince or, or was he just not a fan of tag team wrestling? I, I don't think the vision that he started with. And I'm going to say when he went national, it was about creating IP and and you know, boy, this has been such a topic of discussion through the years. Um, you know, and I don't want to say in creative rooms, but just kind of in wrestling 
business discussions, you know, because when you drill down what the industry is, it's, it's truly creating IP and getting a return on that investment and how much you're going to not, not just pay the talent, but the television time, the resources, j just everything that goes with, because we're all IP chess pieces, if you will. And I think the original vision of the WWF was let's start with Hulk. And, you know, it was, oh gosh, you know, the main events every year on mania, but you can just kind of look at, at the end of the day, it was about creating uh, at the very top, the, the, the brand WWF, but creating the return on the re re investment for Hulk Hogan. Probably Russ made he one, two, three, four, and five, and I know he did movies on that. But when you transition, anyway, his his Vince's single fo focus, and and I say single in that that was his 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 is very narrow was getting building the IP in singles. And when you build a tag, uh, I think a lot of times he said, okay, that's double the expense in 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 payoffs, in flights, in maybe hotel rooms. And however you monetize, it just goes across the board. So I, I don't think that he didn't like tags. I think that he uh, and other promoters, like my, I, I can't say that my father always said the most money that he ever drew in tag teams through the years is when he teamed Lawler and Dundee up, two singles, and brought together over a personal issue and made money. Now, he, Fabs, you know, he was a part of creating the Fabulous Ones, the Rock and Roll Express, and countless others. He loved tag team wrestling and he liked creating tag teams. But I think as promoters and mindsets in the industry is okay, let's create this single and then create another single and create another single. And if you have 10 singles, you, you may have a better ROI than if you created, uh, we'll call it four singles and three tags. If you will, I, anyhow, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to you, Conrad. That's it's it's a it's a fascinating discussion because when you look in the ebb and flow of tag team wrestling, once the business got out of the territories, it is very up and down. I mean, we're about to come into a period in 1999, the Dudleys, the Hardys, Edge and Christian. You know, we kind of have had a resurgence, and in TNA, the same thing. We it went ebbs and flows. Motor City Machine Guns, Beer Money. Team 3D, uh, America's Most Wanted, Triple X. It, it would be kind of up and down as well. So can't say that it's cyclical, but it is unique to kind of go back as a uh, hist historian and look at it through those lens. Let's also uh, talk about, you know, the reason some of the craziness is happening here in the company is because Vince Russo has, for lack of a better word, the hot hand. Uh, he's been on quite a tear creatively. That combination of Russo and McMahon seems to have really started to work. I mean, you know, back in April of 98, it's the first time raw would beat nitro. Here we are several months later and man, it feels like the WWF is starting to pull away. What was your relationship like in this era with Vince Russo? Because I know later in the year when he leaves for greener pastures with WCW, you're not far behind him. In early 99, were you guys tight or what was that relationship like? Yeah, I mean, we always, so Double J created, uh, for all intents and purposes, in the summer, fall of 93. So 94, when I got up there, Vince Russo, um, he, he was not a part of the creative team. Um, I don't know what that department was called, but it was marketing probably because he wrote the magazine or one of the writers for the magazine. I think he did other things, but that was his main kind of uh, mindset. And in White Plains, New York at a uh, TV taping, he introduced himself to me and said, Hey, I would like to do a, a story on the character double J and kind of give some depth and all this. And I said, Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm all about it. And uh, I've, I think I've told this story a couple of different times. Um, you know, a lot of talent through the years, and I'm not saying at the WWF, I'm talking about even in the USWA. And I'm going to take you, boy, you uh, talk about a story behind the story. Have I told you the story about Cowan, Tennessee, Conrad? Is this right no, right? I don't think so. Okay. Cowan, Tennessee is a little bitty town 
at the bottom of Mont Eagle. Um, and so it's kind of on the fringes uh, back in those days of our ABC affiliate, WKRN, that had our local wrestling on. And we would run Cowan, I think, two or three times a year, something along those lines. But um, we ran a show somewhat close to Cowan, and I knew Cowan was like in two months. And my grandmother said, hey, the newspaper writer is going to be there, but he wants to talk to you about because he wants to do a piece to promote Cowan. And I'm like, okay. And I can remember her uh, at this spot show that was before Cowan coming up. She's pulled me aside and she said, I want you to look out here in this arena or high school gym, not arena. And she said, I, 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 I want you to hear something real good. And I'm like, okay. She said, do you know who's probably one of the most important people in the building is? And I'm like, no, Teeny, I don't. She pointed over at the, the, the guy there and I said, who's that? She said, he's going to write a story. And that story is going to do more for Cowan than our TV is because not everybody can watch it. But in this town, everybody reads the paper. And it is going to help us sell a lot of tickets. So you be kind to him. And she would tell me many times, don't argue about wrestling, religion, or politics. But she taught me the ropes of that. And my dad obviously would, would as well. But I gave that guy an interview. But it always stuck with me. And I did, I don't know how many local interviews I've done through the years, either local radio or local newspaper interviews. But that having that mindset brought me into – early 94 when Vince Russo said, Hey, I'd like to put you in the magazine. And as I learned, some of the guys never had time for him or didn't want to sit down with him or, you know, it was just, Hey, I'll do the bigger stuff. If you will, that's what started our relationship. And then, you know, we, we were friends and colleagues throughout the year kept on, kept on. And I think you're asking about 98 and 99. Yes, we were friends. Uh, I can tell you during the attitude era, um, what a wild deal, you know, he was pitching ideas and coming off of the survivor series when the evil McMahon character was created and Austin was red hot and then rock and taker and DX, it was just rocking and rolling. So, uh, Vince had his hands full, but yeah, we were, we, we were good buds during this time. We should also mention that although you're tagging with Owen on TV, you're still working singles on house shows. I found in my research that you were working with Goldust a lot on the road here in a singles capacity. And that made me wonder, why do you think that is? Was it simply because those cards had already been promoted and advertised and it was just easier to deliver on that? We're trying to stretch. I mean, I'm, I'm really legitimately curious why there was a disconnect from what we're seeing on TV to then what we see at the live events. If I remember correctly, and you may do better than this, but Jim Ross booked the house shows. Yes. And, um, and probably Bruce was involved that as well. But as the attitude era began to blossom, if you will, I can't say there was a disconnect, but there was because Jim Ross had to get his cards maybe six weeks, eight weeks in advance and get them out. And when those cards, it it morphed into a little bit different, that the cards would be, you would put talent who's on the show and book the card as it got closer because the evolution of the product knew that, you know, I'm, I'm sure when JR had the deadline that, okay, Minneapolis or Topeka or whatever uh, live event needs the card, Jarrett and Owen being put together might not have even been thought of. So um, we had done, I don't know what pay-per-view it was, but me and Dustin Goldust had uh, worked a pay-per-view and and stuff like that. So a lot of times, whatever the pay-per-view card was that month, JR would basically book rematches out into the town because he knew those matches had been given TV time. Let's also talk a a little bit about uh, Deborah. She's sort of going to round out the duo. We've talked a little bit about your relationship with Deborah before and and how maybe, you know, that all changed when in real life, she started hanging out with uh, Steve Austin, but what was Deborah's relationship with Owen? Like we haven't spent much time talking about that here on the show, you know, cause and we have for folks that might not have caught one of those episodes, you know, the four horsemen set of circumstances with Bongo. Um, and we did that 
I'll call it kind of quasi storyline in WCW. And then, you know, I show up to TV one day and Russo's like, all right, Deborah's going to walk to the ring with you. Uh, okay. And then if you're watching on my world with YouTube right now, if you see that out outfit, Owen got that outfit to match my silver, uh, in black and red. Uh, so we actually did have some matching tights at one time, but, uh, Owen had a very professional relationship with Deborah. Uh, but again, y you know, this is a unique time in the industry in that it was shock TV in so many ways. And Owen was, I can't say super vocal, but he was vocal enough that he didn't agree with everything. Uh, he certainly, you know, his father's promotion, um, uh, didn't book any of that type stuff. And so he was a believer in that. Okay, man, this is, this is not traditional professional wrestling and, uh, WWF and Rousseau or McMahon or whoever else their counter. That was exactly. It's not, that's why we're doing it. Let's talk about the Royal rumble. Uh, you and Owen are both going to be in that Royal rumble match. And that of course is really a backdrop to the, the Austin McMahon story, but the thing that everybody talks about with this particular rumble pay-per-view is not the actual rumble match itself. It's actually the mankind and the rock. I quit match where Mick Foley took just a tremendous amount of punishment. This is where he had his family there to see him perform in the front row. And it was all being filmed for that documentary beyond the mat, but just one unprotected chair shot after another. I know there was some hard feelings about maybe the rock took liberties or did too many shots or whatever it may have been, but it was brutal to the point that Meltzer real paragraph after paragraph about what a dangerous precedent this was setting and the long-term effects that this sort of thing could have. It was scary to watch. And I know that, you know, when we talk about Memphis earlier, man, Memphis was really known for hardcore once upon a time, the blood and the violence and you know, the concession stand brawl and all that stuff. But when you saw these chair shots, and this is an era where guys like balls, Mahoney and Axel rotten and Mike awesome and Masato Tanaka over on the ECW show, man, it is just full bore with steel chairs, but this was a new level of violence. You're inside the industry. You're one of the boys. what did you think when you saw that match and all the violence? This was in California, right, Conrad? Because I think so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The only reason I say that is I think it was still daylight outside, or or yeah, the show. Anyway, one of those time changes. Anaheim. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I don't even know why my OCD brain just saw that. But what did I think of it, Conrad? I want to make sure I'm answering your question. Well, I mean, just because the number the number of chair shots. Like, is there an an understanding amongst talent about the right way to throw a chair shot and the wrong way the guy's handcuffed. Yeah. And, well, and we're seeing multiple shots and we didn't know what we know now about CTE. I think everybody knows that, but I just wonder in at the time, 25 years ago, what'd you think? <laughs> so besides I ain't doing it. <laughs> well, it's, it's a hold on. If you go back and look at some of the moon dog brawls and we had those one by six boards, and if you swing that one by six board the right way, they're going to splinter and it's going to hurt, but it's not going to be the end of the day. And I've told you about the hospital run I made and the doctor's like, what the hell is going on? You know, I thought I had intestine issues. And he said, we've done a cat stan of your entire body. What the hell's going on with your head? Oh, I've had a few matches. Um, but no. So when I saw it, what you just said knowing the ECW stuff, but more importantly for me in my career, all the stuff that we had seen in Memphis and guys that know how to swing a chair and don't know how to swing a chair. And I'm saying that with the total, I want to be careful here. We didn't know a damn thing about CTE. We knew about getting your bell rung and hell, you got your bell rung every day at football practice. So not that big a deal, but I did. This may sound a little wacky. I just had, remember kind of seeing, okay, what a insane, crazy story that Mick don't give a damn. I mean, he's going to put his body through hell, but the amount of 
heat, and I don't know if that's the exact term, but the character development that that put on the face of The Rock. As a heel, you got to look and go, holy crap, what a ruthless, vicious, yes, it's sports entertainment, it's scripted, it's a, but people, you know, three feet from it or sitting at home go, now, wait a minute, guys, you can call this fake all you want, but he's knocking the hell out of that guy. But in an overall presentation, it's like, and, you know, they walk through it, and I'm not going to say they rehearsed it, but the camera shots and the audio you could hear, and it's it, between Mick and, and Rock and the presentation, it was taking the business, and I'm not going to say to a higher level, but it took the business to another level, like Mick falling off the top of the hell in the cell. It 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 just it it opened so many. I say opened so many things up. It was it was sh shocking. But the again, I'm going to go back into maybe I'm going to go back to what I said a few minutes ago, Conrad. The ROI. You want to build two characters, um, and if you could kind of take out the 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 pain threshold and the head head trauma and the CTE, and I know you can't, but watching that, Conrad, I knew that I was watching something that was really unique and really special and the fans were getting uncomfortable. The announcers were getting uncomfortable. The boys backstage, I can't say all of them, but everybody knew, okay, this is really, you know, it's in that gray area. We crossing the line here, but at the end of the day, that's, that's how you make money. And so I was in my mind learning first, but also knowing they are really taking things. And, uh, I mean, we're talking about today, Conrad, would you put this, I would put this in certainly top 10, maybe top five matches or moments that help define the attitude era. Would you say that's a safe assumption? I don't know, man. Uh, this one's hard to watch, you know, with yeah. the context of, of what we know from the documentary and the books and now, now, what I'm talking about when you watched it live, that's what I'm saying. It's a completely different thing. Hindsight's 2020. Watching it live, did you have that thought? I still don't think I, I would put it in the top five. I mean, it's certainly important, but I don't know that it would have been top five. Okay. The Austin McMahon match on Raw would have been one. Yeah. Um, well, there's well, lots of different attitude era moments, but as far as matches, you put the I, Undertaker, uh, take, uh, take. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's probably number one. Oh, wow. The hell in the cell. I mean, cause we're still talking about it. No, 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 no. I, I love taker. I, I'm talking about the Austin and undertaker, uh, symbolism. Oh no, no, no. I thought you were talking about off the cage. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely hell, hell in the cell is definitely, uh, yeah. up there. so maybe not top five, but maybe this this match it defined the era i mean I, I get what you're saying of it was important that we're turning up the volume on um violence I, I'm, no, no other yeah. way to it's yeah. it's it it, it, it it turned it up cranked it up the violent part of it well i'll tell you what it was not good for your health but we're trying to look out for your health which is why we're recommending signos i'm a big believer in this i know you are too jeff and i know you recently had a personal story with this that we want to share but I, uh, I just want to remind everybody that I can't believe this is real. There's 96 million American adults, more than one in three that have pre-diabetes and maybe even more alarming than that of those with pre-diabetes, like more than 80% don't even know they have it. And I have to admit before I learned about all this, I was totally ignorant to this, but foods that are high in carbohydrates, raise your blood sugar more than other foods. And during digestion, the pancreas produces insulin, which then binds the sugar in the blood and takes it into cells as a source of energy. Now, if you have pre-diabetes, what happens is the sugar begins to build up in the bloodstream rather than fueling the cells. And that's when insulin resistance occurs. And most people believe that's the number one cost of pre-diabetes. And, and maintaining a healthy weight allows the insulin in your body to work more efficiently and can help to keep blood sugars within a normal range. A healthy diet and regular exercise are the best ways to get that blood sugar in line. But sometimes you're flying blind. And I know you've got a story you're going to share with us about that, but 
Cygnos can help you short circuit this cycle. It's going to use data directly from your body to help you design a weight loss plan that's unique to your lifestyle. The way they do this is they combine a CGM. My wife tells me that stands for continuous glucose monitor. And Cygnos is the only company that combines one of these CGMs and an AI driven app to deliver to you real time glucose monitoring for optimal health and weight management. You see with Cygnos, now you'll literally be able to see which foods cause your blood sugar to spike above reasonable levels and get real time alerts to do a bit of exercise to bring them back down. Now, on average, people make about 227 different food choices a day. You'll learn the difference between stress eating and physical hunger. You'll be able to better manage your energy throughout the day. You'll even sleep better at night. More importantly, though, you're going to help meet your weight loss and health goals a lot faster because for the first time you have data that's unique to you. It's right from your bloodstream. It's amazing. My wife I've mentioned before works in clinical research. And when it, the CGM showed up, she opened the, the mail, opened our box. Cause we've had all of our sponsors here on the show. And she said, honey, this is a real medical device. We use this at work. This is the real deal. And the idea that it pairs with an app on your phone, man, it's like a life hack. What you'll see is like how a glass of wine with dinner really changes everything. How just putting a little bit of butter in your coffee or a little bit of sugar in your coffee that changes everything. But it'll even give you a heads up to do like a little short walk. Now I'm not saying in the middle of your day, it's going to encourage you to go run a freaking marathon. I'm just saying, Hey, why don't you take the dog for a walk right fast and bam, you get yourself back in the right level. This is a life hack to achieving the optimal health results and weight results that you've been looking for. And I was totally ignorant to this. I was thinking you just do things the old fashioned way. Why not let the robots do it, man? Cygnos has figured this out. They've got the technology to make it easier for you. Why aren't you achieving your health goals or at least on that track? Cygnos can help. They've removed the guesswork of weight loss. They're going to provide you with the tools and knowledge that you need to develop healthier habits. It combines your glucose data from the CGM or continuous glucose monitor with the AI driven app to deliver you real time glucose insights for optimal health and weight management. Right now, Cygnos even has an, an offer exclusively for our listeners. All you got to do is go to Cygnos.com. That's S I G N O S.com. You'll get up to 20% off select plans when you use our code MYWORLD today. That's Cygnos.com. Use the code MYWORLD and you'll get up to 20% off select plans today. And Jeff, you were telling me before we clicked record that when you went to see your accountant last week, one of the boys down at the office, he's already signed up with Cygnos and seeing a difference. It's, it's amazing. You know, I'm, uh, I guess you could say I am a health nut. Uh, and and if, I'll just say this. Yes, one of my uh, accountants, uh, he, he dove in at first. It's the real deal. But I'll just say this. If anybody's listening to this and thinks they might, just might have a little blood sugar issue, you do. Uh, I'm just going to take, take a leap. You probably do. So I highly encourage you to sign up uh, because it's the real deal. And there's one thing that you do not want to mess with. That is your blood sugar. So Cygnos, promo code my world. <laughs> Check it out. You'll be glad you did. So listen, the night after the Royal Rumble, there's all this controversy about the Mick Foley rock match because as you probably recall, it was a pre-recorded I quit from the Sunday Night Heat promo. Mankind or Mick Foley did not actually quit. And neither did you and Owen because y'all win the tax traps the very next night, defeating Ken Shamrock and Big Boss Man. Meltzer would say Lawler observed that Shamrock wasn't distracted by Deborah. He's normally a horn dog. <laughs> Deborah stripped her down to her bra, but Shamrock wasn't distracted. Shamrock applied the ankle lock on Owen. Jarrett made the save. Coco beware, not identified in a blue blazer outfit, then ran to the ring and knocked out Shamrock with a guitar. Owen scored the pin. So you guys become tag champs. Some shenanigans a run in from an African-American blue blazer and it's Coco beware, the former tag team partner of Owen and a guy who was famous for throwing one of the best looking drop kicks in the history of Memphis. What a special and kind of random night. This was, huh? <laughs> Conrad random is the absolute best word for this because, and look, I, I don't think there was a master plan. Like so many things at the time it was segment by segment and entertainment and, 
shock value here and there. But, you know, Owen denying uh, and the ins and outs of the Blue Blazer character all the way through this run. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not the Blue Blazer. I'm not this. Well, a nice curve um, that it's going to be an African-American and, and not Owen. But, you know, you have to go down th- that that road of, oh, his old tag team partner, Coco Beware. But none of this really ever came to fruition. It was just a random kind of hodgepodge for the next couple of uh, weeks uh, and even months of the Blue Blazer character. But um, it, <laughs> uh, I, I just I, – I'm the reason one, one of the reasons I'm chuckling is is just the look on Owen's face. We didn't know Coco was coming in. Uh, what? We, I mean, yeah, of course. Yes, we knew he's coming in the match. We didn't know he was going to be at Raw when he showed up. Uh, it just, okay, I got it. And it, all, again, kind of week to week or every other week, week to week decision making. And so there was never long storyline arch that, okay, this is how we're going to pay off the Blue Blazer story. That was, that was, no, this is this week, Coco, your Blue Blazer. How, talk to me about when you find out you're winning the tax traps. You find out that day at TV or did you know ahead of time? Oh. Found out, uh, you know what? We probably, uh, you know, I don't remember the the exact moment. Probably found out going into the weekend with the Rumble and that year the the it was uh, Austin McMahon uh, story, if you will, completely in the Rumble. Uh, we knew we were going to be bits parts players, but we probably find out going into the week. I we like what you saw because Vince did like um, he liked what he saw in Jeff and Owen, and I, th- I think most everybody did. Everybody's like, okay. That team clicks. Let, let's roll with it. Any good Coco stories from back in the day? I mean, I don't know when we'll talk about Coco beware again, so I want to make the most of it right now. Okay. Well, a good call. The The story that always stands out. Um, gosh, I'm going to get my West Tennessee towns. Um, Nobody in Ireland knows the difference. Well, if you, because I'm uh, Google Coco, where he went to high school, Coco beware. I want to say <laughs> where he went to high school, <laughs> the high school story. Um, okay. I'm looking, I'll see if I can find it. If you can find it. Cause it, it ties into the story. You're like, what the hell? <laughs> Union city high school, Union city, Tennessee. Okay. That's what, thank you. Union city, Tennessee. So, uh, how old is Coco? This is you have it pulled up. Cause I'll give the, he's the born time. in 58. So he's 65. Okay. So 78, mid seventies, he's in high school, right? Yep. He would have probably graduated in like 76. Okay. There was racial tensions in the high school and Coco was a badass football player, but very likable and all this, but there were some racial tensions. And, uh, the story that has been told to me multiple times through the years is that Coco is the one that united his high school that um wow yes that basically uh, as a high school senior you know star athlete um but man you're around coco you can't help but laugh and have a good time and smile and you know all all, all the he's just a jovial uh a cat but um i just remember gosh my dad told me this story eddie marlin uh, we would run Union City, Tennessee as a spot show. It was kind of reiterated, but he took a stand and basically did not let his high school um, get divided by uh, racial uh, tension. And he united the school. And, um, you know, uh, that that's, that's the first story that always comes to my mind about really doing something that really, really matters. Now, I could tell you him and Bobby Eaton um, as a tag team, fantastic. Uh, one of my favorite teams is a, I was a, maybe, I don't know, middle schooler, maybe getting in high school. I don't know exactly what years, but he teamed with Nor- Norville Austin uh, as the PYTs, the pretty young things. Uh, they had the Jerry curls, but they were both bump taking heels and very entertaining. Um, and then, you know, Coco through the years. And I've told you my favorite uh, match of Coco is that uh, my dad and, and Lawler, they didn't want um, Lawler to, to end up, facing flair, the timing, the creative and whatever it may be. Uh, and they wanted flair to get a win. Uh, and so they did a story on TV where Coco, uh, ended up getting the NWA title shot. And I watched it, uh, as a kid, 
from the back of the Coliseum. And then about halfway down the match, I kind of eased down to the back row of ringside. But um, that is probably the, the night that I, I really, I can't, I, I, the, the, I can't say become a Ric Flair fan, but I was in awe of, oh, wow. They have the people standing halfway through this match and all the way out. Rick had convinced the Mid-South Coliseum fans that Coco was going to beat him that night. It was phenomenal. And Coco's athletic ability and the drop kicks and every, I mean, just super. So I love Coco. Coco's a, 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 a good cat. And, uh, yeah, there's my Coco stories. You remember, um, our old great close personal friend, Pond Water Dave, that you had an interaction with at a green room once at uh, Top Guy Weekend. I'll never forget the look that I felt on my face when he looked up at me. <laughs> well, he uh, he has a great Coco Beware story. You'll have to uh, you'll have to ask him about it someday. It's way funnier when he tells it, but okay. the gist is, you know, he was doing. He grew up in in Mississippi and and Texas, so there was a spot show where Coco was there and he was a heel. Okay. And so he comes out. And of course, in those territory days, when a heel comes out, usually the fans throw them the thumbs down and boo and so forth. Coco came by, saw upon water. Dave's sister had some not too kind words for her that you would not even appreciate me saying on this program. Okay. But when you hear him tell it. It's hilarious because we'll get him worked up about it just because we're talking about it on the show today. So this <laughs> happened in the early eighties. This happened 40 years ago. He's still mad. Oh, still mad at Coco so to this day. Coco did a good job, right? Of being yeah. a heel. And, and you, and you would love that because oh. occasionally I'll send you a message where someone DMs me about how much they hate you because in 1999, I stood behind the building for four hours and it was raining and you were a heel, of course, and they asked for an autograph and you blew them off and they never forgave you, but they still listen every week. That's great. <laughs> when, 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 when you remember 30, 40 years later and you're still pissed off about it, that guy did his job. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's talk about WrestleMania for a minute because you know, it's clear after you win the tag straps after Royal rumble, I think everybody knows like the, the chart. And, and the course for WrestleMania starts to be defined a little bit after Royal Rumble. So people have a good idea of what they're going to be doing. So it does make sense that you would think, okay, I'm going to be in a tag match for this WrestleMania. Now, the reason I bring that up is Kevin Nash has said on multiple shoot interviews back before guaranteed contracts, you didn't really know what kind of year you were going to have until you got your WrestleMania payday. It could make or break your whole year. But when you find out that, all right, well, I'm going to be in a tag match for this WrestleMania, were you concerned how that might affect your payoff or no? Not really, because this is, to me, when things really started to transition, as far as that, because the first year of monthly pay-per-views in your house, would that have been 95? Yep. 96. So probably 96. You can just kind of see that the, the transition had taken place that outside of WrestleMania, even SummerSlam, Royal Rumble, Survivor Series, those didn't have near the cachet that they had when there was just four. And I kind of think that was the very, very beginning of that, if that makes sense, in that I wasn't overly concerned and I was elated in, in a lot of ways that, okay, uh, they put the belts on us. What is this? January? Yeah. Uh, yeah. J January. All right. I'm thinking if we have a tag title match, I, we might not lose at Mania at this point. So no, uh, but, but I think Kevin, S certainly through 95, 96, probably even still, you knew that that did dictate everything. Uh, payoffs, where you were going, where you were thought about from the very top of the management system. Um, you just kind of knew your lot in, uh, on the card. Uh, that began to change, in my opinion, 97, 98, 
that again, it was mania and everything else. We would see uh, you working on Monday Night Heat against the big boss man. Boss man is going to pick up a win here. Um, but this is a heel versus heel match on TV. I mean, boss man's a heel. You're a heel. I know you're more of a traditionalist. Is that difficult? A heel versus heel match? Well, man, and that's, I mean, I think Ray does get his flowers when, when the folks that know, know of how good he was and that he was smart enough or, 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 or our mentality and me and Ray were buds. We traveled some together in uh, WCW. Um, so when he came back, uh, up there, um, you know, I always got along real well with him, but we kind of knew this is a quick TV match. Both do our character stuff. Not one's going to be babyface over the other. Although with Deborah in my corner, I had the natural disposition to be the heel because she's a baby face as well. And I can be the heel. And that was kind of the whole stick. Uh, the, the dominant male, if you will, that didn't want her to share her puppies and all that kind of stuff. So raise business. So we set up the quick TV match to, uh, take care of each other and our characters. Halftime heat happens in this era. This is an empty arena match, probably made most famous by Jerry Lawler and Terry Funk in Memphis. Again, now remember, there's a lot of people who say, oh, that Memphis crap. Oh, but we're going to steal this idea. We're going to steal that idea. What do you think of the original empty arena match with Lawler and Funk? And then what do you think of Mankind and The Rock doing it here? More importantly, as a way to promote changing the channel from the Super Bowl in order to watch wrestling because the WWF is super hot here in early 99. What do you think of the OG and then the reprisal, if you will? And, you know, we got to throw in Kurt and Sting in TNA. We just covered it a couple of weeks ago, the highest rated segment up to that time. And I thought kind of the, the, uh, the, the fancy sauce of the TNA version was getting the crowd mix into it, the real time crowd that was outside the building actually watching. So it's so important in our industry. If you, if to me, if you, you know, the, the funk Lawler, Mid South Coliseum, it, it was such an anomaly and so different, but you know, in a lot of ways you watch it, you know, Lawler tell you this day, didn't draw with a damn on the return. You know, they worked their ass off. It was different. We're still talking about it to this day. Like it was legendary sellout business. The reality is the Coliseum, it didn't pop it any more or any less. It, it didn't do big business, but it was certainly talked about. This marketing initiative I thought was brilliant. I mean, in, in so many ways that all the eyeballs that the Super Bowl gathers, and I'm not sure what year you may know. I don't know the first year that WWE advertised within the Super Bowl. Um, always kind of having that mindset and, and thought process, but to actually give them alternative programming during the mega game of the year. It was this same year, by the way, 99. That they, I mean, they, they ran a commercial and they did halftime heat. Huge. I mean, that yeah. you talk about branding. And, and 11 million people saw the match, Jeff. 11 million. Well, I just said I loved it. The marketing mindset, it was brilliant. It worked. I mean, it absolutely, you know, you, you talk about the impressions. Uh, and look, where we're at today, and, I, you know, all, all the mainstream visibility that professional wrestling is today, these things that took place in that nineties. And, you know, um, I don't know how long ago I was talking to a couple of different guys. Uh, it might've been Adam, but you know, just the, the amount of minutes that turn into hours that turn out tell everybody who Adam is. I know, but tell them who you mean. Adam Copeland. Yep. Edge. Yep. Edge. Yeah. J just the, the, the amount of minutes that turn into hours that, that turn into so many impressions of guys that have been on TV through the years. Well, just extrapolate that out to the brand. It, it, that, that's why I just the branding. Uh, that's why to, to me, I just stand in amazement in so many ways. The AEW brand has only been around five, well, 
So more than five years, but not much longer than five years. And, and look, I don't want to just put it on the Wembley. Wembley is an example, but the AEW branding is phenomenal. Do we do everything right? Of course not. Does WWE do everything right? Of course not. No, it's ups, ebbs and flows and all that. But the, the status and the positioning of professional wrestling in today's sports and entertainment marketplace is unfathomable to territory promoters. It, 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 it's, it's, it's truly unbelievable. It really is. I'll give that to UFC as well. Look where that didn't exist really in the nineties. It was boxing and kickboxing and stuff like that. Now MMA is as common as NHL or, or maybe even bigger. And hockey has been around for how many years? You know, you just, it's, it's amazing how, things change well the more things change the more they stay the same we're going to see uh kevin kelly interview deborah mcmichael on raw and sexual chocolate mark henry is going to give her a rose so we're debuting a new character here in this era for mark henry he's no longer just the world's strongest man now he's a he's a ladies man <laughs> you're working some house shows with uh owen here your very first uh house shows as a tag team champion would include wins over test and the big boss man later road dog and x-pac i'm sure you had fun with that one finally godfather and val venus you're in madison square garden for that one on february 7th i mean i know that you know title belts are what they are but man to be a tag team champion at madison square garden uh boy 15 year old jeff jarrett wouldn't have believed that would he you ain't kidding and and so appropriate and it, we weren't, you know, I can, I literally can almost close my eyes and just hear Owen and his such unique sense of humor. Yeah, Jeff, I grew up in Calgary. You grew up in Nashville, sons of promoters, we scratch, we clawed, you worked the territory. You went to Dallas, went to Puerto Rico, Japan. I went to Mexico, went to Japan, came up the hard way. What a road it's been. We have fought, we've clawed, we've had this, we've had that. I mean, he'd give it the big build up. And yep, here we are going against two all time greats, the Godfather and Val Venus. <laughs> you know, it is so attitude era that, you know, two second generation wrestlers were literally going to go into a all character. I mean, th th those characters also were very, they, they just, uh, they're a part of defining, you know, the Godfather, a quote unquote pimp and Val Venus, a quote unquote porn star. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's sports entertainment, my man. It's wild and it's working. You're, you're doing huge business, huge sold out crowds everywhere you go. Even raw Saturday night was taped in the sky dome. 38,661 paid for a yeah. raw. Yeah. Uh, they're going to watch you lose to D'Lo Brown. When ivory makes her surprise debut to counteract Deborah. Were you familiar with ivory before she made her debut here? Had you seen any of her stuff from back I, in the day? I had not. I had not, uh, she always struck me, you know, she went into the same hall of fame, hall of fame class, uh, 2018. Um, but, uh, no, she, the thing, her professionalism, but going through things, she always had ideas and wasn't bashful and said, Hey, what about this? What about that? Or ask questions, all that she was, she, she wanted I'm not saying others didn't, but she cared about the segment she was in. She wanted it to be the, I always will remember her about this. She wanted her segment to be the very best it could be and would ask the right questions or the suggestions to, to, to contribute. Let's talk about St. Valentine's day massacre in Memphis. This is where we're going to be debuting, uh, the former giant from WCW here in the WWF as Paul white, he's going to burst through the, uh, ring canvas. Uh, when uh, Stone Cold is wrestling Vince McMahon and what used to be the big blue cage. Now it's been painted black. But before we got to that main event, you're going to be teaming up with uh, Owen Hart 
to retain your tag titles over D Lo and Mark Henry, nine and a half minutes. Meltzer would say that Henry's working with a bad knee, so he's pretty limited. And he said it should have been better because of that, because D Lo was a good worker and had to work 90% of the match. But for whatever reason, it just didn't click. And man, Meltzer is uh not always complimentary of old double J. <laughs> Quote, Jarrett wasn't even the slightest bit over in Memphis where he spent years as a main eventer, no heat. And considering three of the four guys are solid workers that never gained momentum, fans didn't care about the wrestling because the focus was on Ivory and Deborah. The finish saw the women argue and Hart hit Henry in the knee, breaking the guitar, and Jarrett got the submission with the figure four, presumably to set up an injury angle and give Henry a few weeks off. The women went at it afterwards with Ivory ripping the back of Deborah's blazer. I guess we should just time out here because I I, I want to know, like at this point, were you growing tired or did it ever bother you that it felt like at times the fans by and large, we we've made this puppies thing so big that we got a bunch of guys in the audience who are more interested in maybe whether or not they can see a piece of the female human anatomy more so than paying attention to the wrestling in the ring. Did that ever bother or frustrate you and Owen, or did you just get, it's part of the gig where making people laugh and smile and sending them home happy. Who cares? Well, it was very obvious that that's what the chairman wanted. That, yes. yeah, that that was his mindset on that part of the entertainment. And, you know, I had conversations with Lanza or whoever the agent may be in that, Hey, we're going to have to, and you know, I was a heel and had been a heel on TV. So, you know, the, 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 the mindset of going into this. And I was surprised we actually had this much time because Mark was not well, um, he was banged up. Uh, and, and so we knew all of that, but adding a baby face, here's where I guess you could say the psychology uh, of it all. When you don't have a female to counter Deborah, then you can work the match around me, Owen and her that, no, we're not going to let her show the puppies, but then there's not going to be anything else to the story and maybe till the finish. When you throw in, okay, now they've got a baby face on that side that's in the back, it's going to come out, or she came out, or however it may be, it kind of, the, the people, it's it's almost like they're waiting on the finish. It's the old adage in um, in the Dallas Sportatorium when one of the Von Erics would be wrestling and three heels would jump on one of them, the entire arena quit watching whatever Von Eric was getting beat up and they looked up the baby face out because they knew one of the brothers was coming to save me. It's like they called the finish. That was a set of circumstances that we discussed multiple times, knowing they know something's coming with the Deborah, uh, uh, in the finish somehow, some way. So if we can give a couple of false finishes, it will keep them engaged. When you have Henry hurt, pay-per-view it's supposed for the, for the tag titles, 10 pounds and a five pound bag. Well, the next line on raw from Birmingham, uh, it's going to be a tag team match. You're going to tag with Deborah to take on D and ivory. You go to a no contest. Uh, ivory is going to make the save out of the figure four. Deborah and Ivory soon enter the ring. They start fighting. That goes to a no contest. And then Deborah knocks out Ivory with the guitar. Deborah swinging the guitar. That's kind of fun. Yeah. The thing that was just such a fish out of water, Deborah, and to her defense, she didn't have a clue how to wrestle and right. would openly tell that Ivory could go. Yes. So that was kind of, hey, Vince, as in Russo. Hey, Russo. I know this might look good on paper. It's going to be the shits and execution. She doesn't wrestle. Oh, no, it's okay. We'll do a mixed tag. Well, they don't want to see Ivory just cat fight. It, anyway, it was, I got it. They wanted to do ratings. They wanted to do, how long did that tag match go? One minute, two minutes? If two that. minutes and 20 seconds. That's what I'm saying. No and on one heat, by the way, uh, we'd see Al Snow and D'Lo. They go 159. And yeah. during this match, Deborah comes to ringside, distracts the ref, and then you and uh, Owen run in and attack D'Lo. So Al Snow gets the win. You're continuing the D'Lo story. So uh, on that, I, I remember having these type conversations in that, oh, man, 
uh, bro, just give them the finish. And I'd say, I understand that completely, but a finish can only be a finish. If you kind of have an opening and a high spot, you, you, you have to tell a story to get to the finish. So there is no finish. Let's go do one big continuous high spot. And if you look at it through that lens, that was so many of the matches through the attitude era. They were all, it was just high spot after high spot after high spot. There were, yeah, there were DQs and even some one, two, threes, but they, they were never really finishes. They were just uh, high spots as far as each segment went, which can be frustrating as a viewer. Raw from Chattanooga on February 22nd is a handicap match. It's you and Owen against D'Lo because D'Lo saying you took out Ivory. You took out Mark Henry. I'm going to go it alone. PMS comes to the ring while Deborah has the ref distracted. Jackie's going to climb up on the top rope, drop kick D'Lo and Owen who hit D'Lo with the Enzigiri and scores the pin. Uh, and then Stephanie McMahon, believe it or not, would soon be introduced as a on air character. So this is really the first time we've seen Stephanie. Yeah. We know that Shane has become a bigger part of the program, but now we're going to make it a family fair. A very young Stephanie will start appearing on TV. What was your relationship like, if any, with Stephanie in early 99? And what did you think of her early television appearances? We know eventually she became one of the hotter heels in wrestling, but what did you think about her at first? I mean, it was, like a better word, the boss's daughter. And I could relate to a, a boss's kid being a part of the promotion. I always related w- to, to Shane and Stephanie that way. Uh, yeah. One of those footnotes that you'd like to sometimes say uh, the four scope of wrestling out of all the talent through all the years, who is Stephanie McMahon's first win on TV? You're looking at him. <laughs> so, I mean, I always had a very good relationship uh, with Stephanie and um you know, at this stage, her promo skills weren't what they developed, but she always had, she's always had natural charisma. And I'm not just saying on camera backstage as well. She's very likable, but very well-spoken and always has been since the day I met her. JR is going to return from a, uh, a Bell's palsy break and they bring him back as a heel with Dr. Death. Just one week after we tried dressing Dr. Death up in some sort of silly Japanese mask. Boy, what a talented performer. Just wasn't in the cards for Dr. Death in this era of the WWF. What was in the cards, though, is you and Owen teaming up a lot to take on Triple H and X Pac and a guitar on a pole match, and then just some regular straight up tag matches. When you're working a house show like that, do you like the guitar on a pole step because it's different and you can have some fun with it, or do you just prefer a regular tag? Either way, uh, tag guitar on the poles. You got to have four good workers, and we did. Because you can really let the air out of the match if one of the four guys is standing in the corner or close to that guitar. You go, well, just go up there and get the damn pole. So you yeah. just got to be cognizant of 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 that. But um, again, we could make it work, and and they wanted to put things on live events that were a little different. And they knew that, um, I say they Jr and and company obviously knew that, okay, Jarrett, no one will make sure that this step match is executed well. Cause it, and to me, that's, you know, we didn't always do it, but that's one of the uh, kind of a live event killer. If you have a step match and either they don't even follow through or they have a, just an abysmal step, you'd be better off to go with the straight match, but we made it entertaining. In what would wind up being Dan Severin's final WWF appearance, yourself, Owen, and Dan Severin would defeat Val Venus, Godfather, and Steve Blackman in Springfield, Massachusetts on February 21st. Why do you think it didn't work out for Dan Severin in the WWF? Was just wrong time for this uh, style of wrestling? Like the Attitude Era and Dan Severin probably just aren't a good fit. Connie, you know better than me. Over on my world on YouTube, that photo that just showed, would that be the Dome Globe NWA champion? It would indeed. He's got a UFC Ultimate Fight Championship around his waist, and that's the old 10 pounds of gold that belt collectors call the Domed Globe, made famous by guys like Jack Briscoe and Harley Race and 
of course, uh, Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair and so many others. Yeah. And respect Dan and, and his accomplishments, accomplishments tremendously, but he didn't, his wrestling style did not fit in the attitude era because as we just talked about, uh, I mean, two, three minute TV matches were the norm and that didn't fit to any of Dan's strengths. I think that's the single biggest, um, um, issue with Dan in the attitude era. Uh, and also just his demeanor and his style. I mean, he just, his promo, his mindset, it just didn't fit. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, too much before they were too cool. Scott yeah. Taylor and Brian Christopher were too much. And you actually worked them in a non-title match on Sunday night. Heat, and believe it or not, you lose because D interferes. And we know that they're going to get over like Rover as too cool eventually. But Brian Christopher had been around the WWF for a bit. I mean, they tried even a few years prior to this, bringing back the light heavyweight division and him working with Taka and all, and all that. It just never really clicked. Now we know he found his groove with too cool. Why do you think it took a minute for him to hit with the WWF? Was it a size thing? Was it his, was there some sort of anti Southern bias? Was it Jerry Lawler? Uh, talk me through why you think he didn't have more success right away in the company. You know, I think a, a lot of things, timing's everything. I also think that when I look, I love Brian and had hundreds of matches with him and some really good ones. He like his old man, he knew how to make, he could take care of himself. He could take care of his opponent and everybody at ringside. He really, really good talent. And he obviously grew up watching his father and, and others, but you know, the Memphis weekly territory style was different than WWE. Uh, I can't say dramatically, but it's definitely different. And I had Shawn Michaels, Scott Hall, um, you know, Bret Hart. We could go through a list of guys that, you know, the agents, Chief J. Strongpo would help me out. Lanza would help me out. Pat Patterson would help me out. So I had a bunch of mentors that I listened to. Vince, uh, Vince often pulled in the early Double J. I mean, Vince, Kid Glove characters. Bruce, I had so many different folks that were tweaking and helping. I kind of had the raw clay, but guys that really headed me down, uh, for lack of a better word, exactly what Vince wanted. The audience of one mentality. So I think Brian um, had to find his groove in the WWE style. And once he did, it took off. But I, I would kind of land on, on that more than any one thing. He had to kind of find himself on the uh, sports entertainment stage. Let's talk about some Gaga. That's what this Attitude Era is known for a lot. We're going to start March off in Cleveland, March 1st, 1999 is uh, yourself and Owen Hart teaming up to wrestle Triple H and X-Pac. It goes to a double DQ in just after five minutes. Owen's going to declare before the show, before the match, that he is not a nugget, <laughs> which uh, became an iconic thing for, for Owen. <laughs> and, and Jarrett would say that we've defeated every team in the WWF, everyone they've given us, so we're going to issue an open challenge. And Deborah takes her robe off if the opponents are able to capture the tag titles. Late in the match, X-Pac hits you with the X-Factor. Deborah's distracting the ref. The ref gives in, grabs her butt. X-Pac checks on Deborah after he knocks her to the floor accidentally. Shane McMahon is going to attack X-Pac from behind, whipping him into the stairs. Ivory comes into the ring. She and Deborah, Deborah are exchanging cold stares. Owen and yourself are returning to the back. D'Lo attacks you from behind. Ivory's ripping off Deborah's robe to reveal the red bra and panties. Boy, a lot of moving parts here. I mean, are you really only quote unquote wrestling on the house shows? The rest is just Gaga on TV, right? Well, when you, when you looked at the content, I think I can't say this is one of the first times, but I think during this era, when the stats started coming out, there's in a two hour show, there's 22 minutes of wrestling. Yes. Said all that. And I, on the one hand, I found it fascinating that somebody stopped watching it. And then on the other hand, I would think back to the Memphis television show that we would produce every Saturday morning for 90 minutes. And if you kind of did that, that, you know, they, they were quick enhancement matches, 
uh, if you will. We didn't call them enhancement matches. We call them job matches in those days. And then we would have a TV main event most of the time to, to set up an angle. And if we had a uh, match in the main event that, you know, two out of three falls, depending upon how much TV time's left. Anyway, that to me was always professional wrestling. Go watch a live event if you want a lot of wrestling. A televised uh, wrestling show is going to have a lot of story story and actions and we called them spice ups and promos and everything that went with it. But, uh, yeah, during this era of the attitude era, it was a hot, hot topic. There's no wrestling on a wrestling show. And I totally understand that, uh, mindset, but also know there's always a mix and a balance, but yep. Me and Owen were wrestling on house shows and Gaga on TV. Let's talk about a little more Gaga, but before we do, I wanted to ask you when you said enhancement match, but back then we didn't call it enhancement match. We called it job matches. When do you remember jobber becoming a four letter word in wrestling? Oh, when I arrived in the WWE, okay. I believe when did Kurt Henning become Mr. Perfect? So it doesn't matter. 88. He was in 88. 88. Yeah. I think it, so I think he had a couple of shots with us either 87 or 88. I think Kurt is the first one who ever told me. And I said, do what? He goes, yeah, that's, we, we call them enhancement matches. I'm like, okay. It's not a derogatory term. Okay. So enhancement talent. I, so it might've been late eighties, but you know, by the time I got to the, uh, WWF 92, 93, it was okay. That's how they're, that's what they're called. You know, um, I mean, and I understand why the, the vernacular was changed, but I'll call it the job guys in Memphis. It was never looked at as derogatory. It's like, you have a job to do. You're going to get paid to do this job. The only people that got paid on Saturday mornings for our television taping were the job guys, the top talent, the regular talent, the weekly talent. They never got paid. We didn't get paid to go do TV. It was, you have a job to do and your job is to get the top guys over. You know, it wasn't derogatory, but I understood that it could have that connotation and that's why they changed it. Let's talk about Sunday night heat, March 7th road dogs going to beat you when the blue blazer interferes road dogs attempting to give his intro, but you're going to attack him. Of course, that's big heat. The crowd wants to do sing along Jones here. Owen comes to ringside. Owen's trying to interfere, but the blazer runs out and beats up both you and Jarrett. Of course, after the match, the blazer unmasks. And what do you know? The blue blazer was actually D Lo Brown here. <laughs> Now I want to take a time out right here because it's been rumored for years that the reason the blue blazer character was brought back was because management eventually wanted to do an angle where it appeared that perhaps Owen had a crush on Deborah and that would break up your team and then put you and Owen in a feud. And as the story goes, Owen declined to do this because he didn't want the kids to think that he was cheating on his wife. And more importantly, these kids go to school and the other kids would be then teasing and. So they just bring back the blue blazer to sort of punish Owen. That's the narrative that's out there. Is that the way you remember it going down or is this just internet rumor and innuendo innuendo, but the, the kind of the mindset behind it all, I, I believe, you know, obviously it didn't get to, to, to fully develop that Owen in real life had issues with certain aspects of the attitude era. And I'll call it with the heart name with, you know, Stu Hart and all the brothers and Brett and of course, Owen and, you know, Owen WrestleMania uh, 10 match and just that whole persona that went with it as opposed to him having issues with certain things about the attitude era. They, in their mind, they said, okay, his alter ego, the blue blazer who Owen had been the blue blazer in the early times that fit. Let's have him be the, um, you know, the superhero who believes in good, 
who has issues with attitude error. And that was the mindset of the whole of the character. And you could play with it back and forth. And there's been plenty of storylines with guys through the years, dusty and midnight rider. And I, we both could give multiple examples, but that was the, uh, the, the impetus of the blue blazer character uh, at this stage in, in the attitude era. I wanted to ask you about uh, this show because it's, it's happening in Pittsburgh and that's where we see the debut of Kurt angle. This is where tiger Ali Singh would be offering fans in the ring or, or some fan to come in the ring and blow his nose on the American flag. And of course he starts with Kurt angle, who's supposed to be the local American hero, if you will. But that's the first time Kurt is really seen with the WWF. And we know he's going to be working down in Memphis, but he's still months away from becoming an in-ring on-air performer. He's going to work a bunch of dark matches and things like that through the spring and summer, but it, we're into Survivor Series before he makes the debut. But I'm curious, as silly as this sounds, he does live in Pittsburgh. He's from Pittsburgh. And this is March of 1999. He married Karen in 1998, as I understand it. Would Karen have been at this show? Is there any chance you you met Karen nope. at this show in 99? The first time I met Karen was in Orlando um end of 90 end of this year. When, okay. When he started actually wrestling and and I think I've told that story. Me, Owen, Kurt, Karen went to the gym to work out. But no, and and until the research on this podcast it didn't make it completely clear, but I don't have any recollection uh, and seeing that photo of Kurt, young Kurt with all the hair. So he just, he, he had been signed, correct? Yeah. yeah but they just had him. So he was in the crowd, Jeff. So they were just yeah. showing him like, yeah. Hey, local sports hero, or, you know, he won the freaking gold medal, but he's from Pittsburgh. So he's the hometown boy and yada, yada, yada. So they were just looking for something for tiger Ali Singh, I assume. So it's funny story because Pittsburgh with the USA Air hub, uh, during 94, 95, 96, 96, I mean, we would, I would fly from Nashville to Pittsburgh and then connect to the Northeast that, you know, those days are gone, but that's when the U S air hub was. But I remember seeing Kurt be, do the, uh, local sports news. I think the NBC affiliate, Yes. Uh, but, but, um, but I know I don't have any recollection of him being at this show. This show in Pittsburgh is also the infamous show where the acolytes and public enemy just beat the shit out of each other. What do you remember that being the talk of in the locker room when the public enemy found out the hard way about the, uh, WWE way of doing wrestling? You know what? I, I love the uh, public enemy, me and grunge. We, we used to crack up now and Rocco, but me, me and grunge, his sense of humor was hilarious. Uh, always got along with those guys. Um, but uh, again, you can just see different folks. And I kind of talked to it on, on Brian that public enemy, they had their, um, their style that, that obviously had worked in, in ECW and, 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 and WCW. Um, yeah. How long have they been in WCW up to this point? Two years, um, whatever. I, I knew, okay, the style of WWF, they're going to have to get acclimated to. I, I just remember in, in the early days, um, but dude, Rocco was a tough son of a bitch too. Um, he, he didn't, he, he could, uh, he could, he could handle himself, but I don't remember any backstage chatter of maybe any internet, internet law lore or anything like that. Let's, uh, let's talk about a really great idea that they came up with in the company it was really ahead of its time. The WWF website ran a contest to come up with your tag team name. And I can't wait to ask you about that. Cause this is 99 before social media and things are just crazy. Now uh, you got a lot of running around this time of year as school starts to wind down. Mother's day's around the corner. The weather's warming up. So spring practices are there for kids. And I want you to know you can eat stress-free this spring with factors, delicious, ready to eat meals. These are fresh, never frozen meals that are chef crafted, dietitian approved, and man, they're ready to eat in just two minutes. You can choose from a weekly menu of over 35 options, including really popular options like calorie smart, 
Maybe you're trying to drop some LBs. Maybe you're on the keto diet. Well, they can hook you up too. Or maybe you're trying to look real jacked in your new shirt like Jeff Jarrett. Well, Protein Plus has you covered. Or perhaps you're trying the vegan and veggie style. Man, there's something for everybody with Factor. And they've even got like 60 add-ons every week. They can cover you for breakfast, on-the-go lunch where you don't even need a microwave. What about the snacks and beverages? They got all that too, everything you need all day long. Get started today and fuel up for those springtime goals. Get chef-prepared meals on the table in just two minutes with Factors, ready-to-eat meals. If you're looking for gourmet meals, let me recommend the premium ingredients. Filet mignon, yeah, truffle butter, broccolini, asparagus, shrimp. It's all available at Factor. It's no fuss, no mess meals. You see, what Factor does is they eliminate the hassle of all the prepping, the cooking, and the cleaning up. All you got to do, man, is heat it and savor the good stuff. And they tailor it to your schedule. You see, you get as much flexibility as you need, whether you need more meals or less meals. Maybe you're traveling. Maybe you got lunch plans. You know, you're going to be out of town. You can pause or reschedule to suit your lifestyle as you go. It's that easy. Factor is your solution for fast premium meals without the need for cooking. And they're celebrating Earth Day all month long. So look out for Earth Month Eats on the menu and uh, you'll see the lowest carbon footprint meals. How about that? Head right now to factormeals.com slash myworld50 and use the code myworld50. You're going to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code myworld50 at factormeals.com slash myworld50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Jeff, we've had a lot of different sponsors over the years, but man, factor is just good every dog on time, is it not? Can I tell you a little factor meal story? Please. It's Easter weekend. We're just coming off of, and my youngest daughter, Jaren, is in town from college. She was headed back to Rome, Georgia. Barry, uh, give to her some spring basketball and studies and all that. And so as she's packing up, Karen likes to put together a little goodie bag and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden I hear uh, out of the, because we have our factor meals in the small fridge, uh, in the laundry room, just off the, uh, um, of the kitchen. Hey, can I take this prime rib or, uh, uh, uh filet mignon? Yeah, I guess. Hey, there's two of them in here. Can I take, yeah, go ahead and take that. Hey, what about this? Yeah. Connie, I'm running low on factor meals right now. She cleaned me out, but it is, if you've got kids away at school or college, uh, she's got the code now, uh, my world 50. She's going to order it, get it delivered. It is, hate to say this, if you have an active lifestyle, which I think everybody does now, and you can't really fit in, I'm going to sit down and cook myself something healthy and all that. I'm telling you, it is a true game changer. Code MyWorld50FactorMeals.com. Honest to goodness, this weekend was a living testament about how uh, much of a rock star factor is in the uh, last outlaw's house. It's healthy eating made easy factormeals.com slash my world 50. Be sure to use the promo code my world 50 and you'll get 50% off that first box. I'm telling you, if you try it, you will love it. Factormeals.com slash my world 50. So Jeff, let's talk about the website idea. Cause I love this. Hmm. You guys were, were asking fans As on the website. Get into this one condition. You won't mention somebody's name. Don't say his name. Don't say his name. Okay. Got it. Um, there's 25,000 entries pretty quickly. Think about that. And Meltzer's saying they may actually narrow it down to 10 finalists and do an angle. Jarrett and Owen were initially against the team name since they're more known as individuals, but management pushed for the team name. And the rumor in innuendo is that the big boss was happy with the team and he wants to give the impression that they're going to be teaming for the long term, even if that really wasn't the idea. So maybe he wanted a catchy name. Maybe that would help with merch. And Deborah could probably help selling some merch. Did you like the idea of a team name? Do you remember hearing any that you liked? Did you and Owen occasionally sort of self deprecate and come up with a funny team name where you guys just referred to yourselves that way? We and we for them to put in the writing. I don't know who, what journalist or critic wrote that. We were definitely not against it. Okay. We were amazed at hey, we're getting a lot of submissions on this. Um, at the end of the day, 
when you saw Stone Cold just about every Monday, certainly every other Monday, come out with a new T-shirt. And um, that image, Marcus, that you showed a little while ago of all the signs uh, that were in the crowd on Monday Night Raw. And it's overwhelming. It, just the, I was gonna say, the, the, the engagement, but the merchandising and Jimmy Miranda, God rest his soul. This is the mania in Philadelphia that we're going to touch on. I mean, look at the amount of signs uh, Toronto doing for a Monday night raw, 36,000, 38,000 people. But the, the, the quarterly checks for merch were fantastic. And if you could get a hot shirt, it was because our live event business, and this is before e-commerce really, really blew up. So you wanted to sell your shirts at live events, not just Rawls, but, but at, at, at the non-televised and me and Owen would have loved to have put that together. So us being against, um, putting together a team name, but we also were leery of, I guess it's like a better word, the corny name. Well, look, we didn't look at it at the time, but you know, too cool was where they landed. It started out with too much. That's kind of hard to wrap your hand around. And and in my mind, you kind of have to look at where I'd come from. We'd done the Aztec Indian. We had went back to the double day character with Robert and you know, that, that, so I was leery of, Hey man, we, me and Owen really have traction right now and it's working. Let's make sure we land on the right name. And we had no idea ultimately what Vince was going to choose, not Russo, but man. So we were definitely, that was a discussion, but we never heard a top 10 and we really didn't you know what. I don't wish I could, I wish he was here. I could ask. I don't think we ever really landed on a favorite one. Um, to my knowledge. Unfortunately, you don't land on your favorite opponent either. I mean, you would have loved to have had this Mark Henry Delo thing pay off. Mark's going to need surgery, not on one, but on both knees. He gets it done at Dr. James Andrews in Birmingham and Meltzer thinks he's going to be ready to return a week or two before mania. And he says he was originally supposed to team with Delo and ivory against Jarrett Owen and Deborah at the pay-per-view. But now instead they're holding a battle Royal with the final two wrestlers in the ring, getting a tag title shot that night against Jarrett and Owen. Do you wish it would have been the other way and been a six man or six person tag team? Who would have been the six? Who would have been our, our partner? Deborah. Yeah, no, I want a tag. You know, I remember on a phone call Russo telling me he's going to have both knees operated on, but we think we have it. I'm like, yeah, he, there's no chance. He Mark is a big dude. He ain't coming back, and rightly so. Yeah. What, what are we? Who, who's telling you that? Oh no, bro. I, I think yeah, I'm like that ain't gonna happen. So you know, it was just wait and see how we were gonna go down this road. What opponents we're gonna come up with? On Raw on March 8th, it's D'Lo beating Owen Hart in a Steel City street fight. You're gonna come in and uh, throw Owen the guitar. D'Lo's gonna intercept the pass and wallop Owen and score the pin. So D'Lo gets the win. A week later, you are tagging with Owen to beat the public enemy. Owen's gonna pin Johnny Grunge in a minute and forty-four seconds. My goodness. Yep. I mean, I don't mean this silly. I know it's just the way it is. But did it ever? I know it has to be frustrating at times. But does it feel like a waste of time to? I'm going to tan. I'm going to get jacked. I'm going to get my gear. I'm going to make sure I'm looking good and smelling good and get all oiled up. And I'll be right back here in two minutes. Yes, it, it, it did. Uh, I'd be BS and yeah, it would be right before our very eyes. The business was morphing because again, this is maybe, uh, to my detriment, there's, you know, the old adage, you can wrestle, but don't become a wrestler. Yes. As a wrestler, you go, but wait a minute. I'm so-and-so, so-and-so. I'm going to the ring and I'm fighting Rocco or D'Lo or whatever other talent. And we're only going to get two minutes, three minutes. It went against the grain of what our brains as wrestlers had become. You had enhancement matches or job matches. Those go two and three minutes because they're, quote unquote, non-competitive, put us in a competitive environment. We're going to go three minutes and it's one big high spot. And we're, we're really more worried about puppies and run-ins and guitars 
and and all that with no build up. But in hindsight, that's exactly what the vision was. We're going to give them a television product uh, as it relates to professional wrestling that they've never ever seen before. It was different. Let's talk about Shotgun March twentieth. This is uh, fun and something you should go out of your way to see. Owen and Jeff against the Hardy Boys. You wouldn't think that's a match, but it was. It went five minutes and ten seconds, March twentieth, nineteen ninety nine. If you want to look that one up, it's pretty crazy to think that you were in there with them so young and all the stuff you guys were going to do together. Look at them. That's the the lower third. It says the Hardy Boys with a Z, and, uh, and not their weight, not their age, not their hometown. Just they're frequent flyers. And they're wearing their indie fed t-shirts on TV. It's great. Uh, Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett, well, along with Deborah, are going to wrestle edge and Gangrel with Christian to a no contest for two minutes and 39 seconds on raw on, uh, March 22nd public enemy comes out, attacks both teams. It's a bit of a mess, but we're trying to get towards this big tag team battle Royal. So let's talk about WrestleMania week. We're finally here. It's WrestleMania 15. I mean, you were a part of WrestleMania way back when WrestleMania week for you started at WrestleMania 10, I believe. And your match got cut just moments before you were supposed to go to the ring because Sean and razor went a little long Mm -hmm. and they made history, but it cost you your first WrestleMania match by the time. WrestleMania 15 rolls around five years later, the company's in another stratosphere. We know this, these days, WrestleMania is like a week long event. What was it like in 1999, just the pandemonium and all the events and all the media and all the schedule demands you would have had compared to just a handful of years prior. So again, this is a transition period. You got to remember, and I'm glad in this episode, we touched on it. So the Philadelphia, um, gosh, it went from the spectrum Wells Fargo. I'm trying to think what it was called during this era, but it, at the end of the day, um, is it the fleet center? No, no, that we're in a different era. That's oh, Boston. It doesn't matter. So it's going to be 14, 15, 16, 17, 18,000 people. The, the, the thing that kind of was ingrained in all of our minds was the reason this show is so important is that we're going to have so many buys, which means our pay-per-view. It was the first union center here, Jeff. Right. Sorry. First union center. That to me, Conrad was, uh, again, the DNA of the talent of a wrestler during this edge, which has completely changed nowadays. I mean, the guys going into this weekend, there's not one person on the card that's thinking about, wow, there's going to be a lot of buys this weekend. I get it. Times have changed in this era. We just came off of Monday Night Raw and our live event pay at Toronto Skydome, uh, whatever we called it back then, 36,000 people. I mean, there's some happy folks. I mean, I bet there were some fights backstage. Not, you know, but the, everybody wanted to be a dark match because you got paid on dark matches on Raw even more. Uh, you know, so so a dark match, um, you know, a, a dark match on, on, on that type raw. So this is a pay-per-view. The live crowd wasn't that big. The demand on our schedule, you know, I can't tell you how many on sales and radio interviews and media days that you do throughout the year. This was kind of condensed. Um, you know, me and Brian and others, you know, the, the, a, a real highlight of WrestleMania week, Conrad, and it sounds so simple is, hey, guess what? We do one check in and one check out <laughs> uh, because you know we're we're here for three days, four days. Uh, Raw, uh, I don't even know where it would be. My guess from Philly would be an Allentown or Scranton or uh, maybe gone down to Baltimore. E- anyway, a drive from Philly, but you know the the schedule and the autographs. It the, our schedule wasn't so taxing um, that that it just killed you, and you did ha- you know. Um, we would do fun, not fun. Yeah. Like uh, charity, charity events and autograph sessions, but they kept us busy and, and kept us going, but it wasn't anything that was unmanageable. Uh, a guy like Austin, a baby face, uh, on this card that was either 
mid or up, their media schedule was kind of insane, if you will. Because remember, the PR department was charged all about impressions, all about generating buys. Just to, it's so different nowadays. Let's talk about Sunday Night Heat before WrestleMania gets started. It's a 21 man battle royal where the last two men earn a tag title shot. They go four minutes and 16 seconds. You're out doing commentary with Owen and Deborah. Other folks in the match are Public Enemy, Viscera, Gilberg, Animal, Eight Ball, Skull, Hawk, Scott Taylor, Farouk, Tiger Ali Singh, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Midian, Brian Christopher, Steve Blackman, Brad Shaw, and Godfather and Draws. The last two men become D'Lo Brown and Test. So they're going to win and get a title shot, but that's not the entertaining part. It's Owen on commentary. Own on commentary was hilarious where he talks about these guys are fatigues really starting to set in. These guys have been fighting more than 20 minutes as a reminder, the match went four minutes total. So that's a little tongue in cheek reference to how quick the match times are. He's having fun in his own way. Oh boy. He's, he's even getting a little jab in at tiger. Ali Singh. watching this back to prepare for our WrestleMania 15 discussions on my different podcasts this week. It made me realize Owen would have been fantastic as a heel color commentator later in life. Would he not? But when I tell you this is such vintage Owen, a peek behind the curtain as if he's sitting around a monitor with just talking to the boys and you know, uh, I don't know what episode it was that we've touched on. I had to do color commentary, um, and Vince was in my ear and he literally busted my, I mean, he was screaming and look, Jim Ross, Michael Cole, you can go down a whole host of others folks that sat in that seat. And I know Mick's got personal stories. I don't see how they kept it together from a mindset of delivering uh, coherent words. But in this circumstance, uh, Vince never said a word in our ear, but I remember just kind of the setup and, and Russo and whoever else said, Oh, Owen, just go have fun with this. And I'm like, Oh boy, all I got to do is follow Owen's lead, but you can't follow it. And so, uh, if I remember correctly, it was, it was a lot of Michael Cole and Owen going back and forth. Well, there won't be any going back and forth or arguing. If you try our new sponsor, Blue Chew, just kidding. They're not a new sponsor. They've been with us from the very beginning, and it's because it really, really works. They're a day one sponsor for us, and we want you to try it if you haven't already. What are you waiting for? I want to be clear. This isn't just for guys who have a problem. This is for guys who are looking for a five-star performance. I really encourage you to take a look at BlueChew.com. What you'll find is they're a unique online service that delivers you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but they're in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, plan ahead, or be ready whenever an opportunity arises, and the process has never been simpler. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part is it's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. And Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code MYWORLD at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code MYWORLD will help you receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. So, Jeff, I think I have this right. Uh, WrestleMania 15 wound up being your very last WrestleMania match, right? How about that? Yeah, I w- wouldn't have thought that at the time. And um, uh, again, just going back to the, the whole kind of era of it on, um, how hot the business was. And, um, you know, I've referenced this a couple of times, but I was just a second ago, I was talking about baby faces on the car and the statue, all this. C- can you go over the car, just kind of the top matches? Cause I'm going to point out something here. It's, um, taker, uh, not rock. Wait, no, I'll, I'll rattle them off. Here you go. Jacqueline and ivory 
the tag team battle Royal. Then the pay-per-view starts triple threat for the hardcore title, hardcore, Holly, Billy Gunn, and Al snow. Then it's your tag match. You're out second on the actual pay-per-view after you guys, it's Butterbean, devastating bark gun and a brawl for all match. Then it's mankind and big show road dog in there against gold dust, Ken Shamrock and Val Venus. It's a four corners elimination match for the IC title. Kane versus triple H Sable versus Tory Shane versus X-Pac undertaker versus big boss man in a really bad hell in a cell match where we hung a guy and in the main event, the rock versus stone cold, Steve Austin. And when you hear that, I don't think you would say, ah, I just talked about merchandise earlier and all that, but the number two merch seller that night (laughs) was the road dog, Jesse James. Wow. And, yeah. And, and I've said that kind of story before, but I remember obviously we were on uh, early and shower and we were backstage and it was getting toward the end of the night, but Miranda walked by and, uh, I would always from a business perspective, Hey man, h- h- how is it out that? Oh, we've done record numbers here and there. And we had stands outside and you know, those days you didn't always have the pop-up tents it was, again, all of the, where we're at today, a lot of it didn't exist. But I remember him spinning around and saying something to the effect, your boy or our boy or whatever it is, road dog number two. And there was two different shirts. Like we sold out every stand in the arena and j- just kind of the, again, the attitude era and, and, and just the flavor of the industry at the time the, the, I really remember this January through this April, uh, I had, I was having a blast and uh, I think last week, uh, talking about, speaking of Road Dog, I told you about a story um, that we, you know, we we had our appearances and autograph sessions and charity uh, appearances we had to do. Uh, but I remember we were going to go out, and so the show would be on a Sunday. So this would have been on a Friday, and uh, we went to one night establishment to another night establishment. And I remember you just kind of bouncing around, and Brian says. Hey man, we're leaving. We're going to some after party. And I'm like, okay, how are we getting there? There's a ride outside for us. We're like, okay. And it's pouring down rain, Conrad. And we're trying to figure out whose actually car we're supposed to get in. Cause I guess there was a group of it. And this guy jumps out of this, Brian called it the Scooby van, but it was like a custom, um, built out, um, it's not a hotel shuttle van, but it was a bit, what do you call those, um, sprinter? Custom, huh? A sprinter? No, not a sprinter. No, that's way too fancy, but it's, it's like a custom made, um, van that, you know, had the slide door and had TVs. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Old school. Like, yeah, I know you're talking about yeah, one of those in, and, and anyhow, <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, yeah, we're getting in that van and they wave us and we run through because it's one of those we're in an underhang, but Econo out, line, that's what I was looking for. That's it. That's it. Okay. Anyway, the door slid open and I think X Pac was with, but me, Brian, and X Pac jumped in this van, had no clue who, what it was. And sitting in the back of the van was Big Pun. Wow. How about that? And you, you know how at this time he was red hot, but big pun was big pun. <laughs> and we rode and through the streets of Philly and went to the next place and pun didn't come in, but some of his guys did. And we went to this place and I said, Brian, what in the world? And he goes, you don't know who that was. And, and, and I'm like, no. And I couldn't really get a good look at him. There was, I don't know, six or seven of us in there, but then he went on to say that. And I think, unfortunately he passed away in the next year or two after that. But yeah. Um, if you ever get a chance. Yeah. He died in February the following year. I mean, he wouldn't, it's crazy to think, you know, how quickly. Yeah. Wow. Lost... Yeah. Anyway, ask Brian about big pun. I can't just... wait. <laughs> the, the, uh, the match is here. I can't believe of all the, do I have this right? You only wrestled two WrestleMania matches, 11 against razor. And then this one. Yep. Cause I was gone. My, uh, bouncing always kind of um well you were at 14 just not working correct yeah but yeah two matches uh, of course the one with razor was super fun this one just feels a little weird because it's not d brown and mark henry 
our suitable replacement for Mark Henry, the other fellow who helped win the battle Royal is test. So it's Owen and Jeff against test and D'Lo. You're going to get the win over D'Lo and a whopping three minutes and 57 seconds. You see there the interest. If you're watching with us on uh, YouTube, Deborah got a blazer on and a really fancy swimsuit. I don't even know if you'd call it that. It's like something you'd wear in a pageant. Uh, Meltzer would say this. Owen said that Owen considers Jarrett the best tag team partner he's ever had, AKA better than Brett and bulldog. D'Lo appears to have gained some weight, which may be why he took, looked a step slower than just a few months ago. D'Lo hit the lowdown on Jarrett at three and a half minutes. Owen stops the pin. Debra then gets on the ring apron to distract D'Lo. Ivory's going to yank Debra to the floor. PMS comes to ringside. D'Lo sets Jarrett up for a pile driver. Owen surprises D'Lo with a drop kick off the top rope. Jarrett flips over D'Lo and scores the pin. Nice finish. D'Lo yells at Test after the match for being distracted by the women and not being there to save him. Okay match, but not long enough to develop into anything substantial. Star and a half. Lot to unpack here. First of all, it's really fast. It's under four minutes. Were you and Owen disappointed in the match? And the placement and just the way the, the cookie crumbled, or is that just part of the business? Well, and that, I'm going back to this was the era then you didn't have much expectations on it because um, even though it was WrestleMania, if I remember correctly, it was still a three-hour block. Um, you try to put eight matches, nine matches in a three-hour block, do the math. It's impossible, uh, and especially with a mania, you have to give time for entrances and pageantry and you know, the cage match on this show, it, 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 you know, again, back to kind of a running, uh, I guess you could say slogan amongst folks. Hey guys, do the math. There's not enough time here. Uh, e even into the TNA days when we would, you know, the, the monthly pay-per-views, once you get past seven, you're out of time. But a lot of times that's just how the arcs work when you're trying to produce uh, a two and three hour television show. Uh, I don't, I'm not asking you to tell me the number. Were you disappointed in the payoff? Do you recall no. being happy or okay? No. It, it, and again, those rolls and, and which were TVs in getting good payoff. Then you get into those house show loops, the garden, you know, maybe fleet center, Boston, Philadelphia, you know, we were all making really good money. If you want more Owen talk, we have uh, one of our early episodes in our, my world run. I can't believe this is real, but we started doing this years ago. Now, Jeff, who would have thought you ain't kidding, pal. Jeez. And years ago, we talked about Owen and unfortunately his, his passing away. And it's one of the better episodes that I've ever been involved with on any podcast. I want to encourage you to go check it out on YouTube. If you missed it, it's my world on youtube.com. I'm glad we got to talk a lot about Owen this week. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to next week. We're going to be talking about your return to the WWE in 2019. You're going to be coming back as a backstage producer. You're going to wrestle in the Royal rumble and on raw. You're going to start helping with, uh, some of the creative. We're going to be talking about, uh, the ins, the outs, the ups, the downs of WWE in 2019. And Jeff, as we were recording today, the New York post had another story about Vince McMahon and the accuser from January, including Vince punching back and naming names in the response. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting week in professional wrestling to say the least. Conrad, the look on you, you're the best. <laughs> I, 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 um, yeah, you and I will talk about this off air before we talk about it on air again, but oh, there's a chance oh. that you want to go to my world on youtube.com, hit the subscribe button and turn the notifications bell on, because I don't know that Jeff and I are going to want to wait a whole week to talk about this. We might want to talk about this before then. And, uh, if our schedules allow, we're going live on YouTube to my world on youtube.com. It's totally free. It doesn't cost anything, uh, but check that out. If you haven't already, I also want to mention that at adfreeshows.com, you get all of our shows early and ad free. You can even be a part of the live studio audience. 
Uh, and want to give a, a special shout out to everybody who hung out with us in the group chat today. I know Bobby was here and coach Rosie was here and John Westbrooks was here and Denovia Smack and so many others. Thanks everybody for showing up. Hey, Alex Whedon, what's going on, man. Appreciate all you guys hanging out. You can also hang out with us in person because we're doing top guy weekend. We've just announced we're coming back to Chicago and there's nothing like it. If you've never been a part of a top guy weekend, I really encourage you to do that. It's not like a traditional, um, fan fest or a star cast or anything like that. It's an experience. And that's what you'll experience. If you actually make it to top guy weekend in Chicago with us this labor day. Uh, but we've also got a lot of bonus content, things like Tuesdays with the taskmaster. That's only at adfreeshows.com. Lex expressed only at adfreeshows.com. Monday mailbag with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick only at adfreeshows.com. The book with David Crockett only at adfreeshows.com. Check it out. If you haven't already adfreeshows.com. And if you've got a question about Jeff in the WWE in 2019, the best place to ask it is on YouTube. That's my world on youtube.com. You can also advertise with us It's much more affordable than you ever imagined. Especially if you're looking for guys that are 25 to 54 years old, we got them at advertise with You can also pick up some brand new swag over at box We got the American dream t-shirt, the last outlaw, the death match King. And of course the chosen son of a promoter, so much fun stuff, something for everybody box of gimmicks.com. Jeff, I never know what to expect when we sit down and click record, but I had a lot of fun today. This is one of the more fun episodes I think we've done in a while. I don't know why I, I like talking about this era of pro wrestling. I don't like going back and watching 1999 wrestling, but I do like talking about it. Uh, and I had a fun time talking today and I hope that the next time people hear us here on my world, Alabama yeah. will have just won the national championship. Now that seems far-fetched at this point, but I wouldn't have guessed a few weeks ago no. we'd be in the doggone final four. You're a basketball junkie. Is your prediction NC state and UConn? Purdue and UConn, and uh, what are you calling for? Uh, so who's cutting the nets down next Monday night. Emma, Connecticut. It's hard to bet if it's Connecticut. I know, right? Yeah, and then I'm going to go ahead and say it. I think Purdue's going to go all the way. How about that? I think UConn will. Of course, I'm pulling for Alabama. Roll Tide. Shout out to Mr. Sears. That fellow's fixing to make a bunch of money. You think? <laughs> I love it. I mean, he's, he's charisma. Uh, unbelievable. But, but, uh, and a kid from muscle shoals, I think, I mean, that's an Alabama native right there. Ain't that crazy? Oh, is he really? I think so. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. There, but it's man, that's I haven't, I haven't, this is the first time I've really had to stop and think when you got a really good point guard, I'm talking too much baseball, basketball. We got a really good point guard and a dominant big man. He, it's, it's very hard to defend. So that's why I'm going Purdue, but it's going to be fun. Uh, you know, I want to figure out this YouTube thing. Conrad. We've been talking, maybe there's something around dynamite, maybe collision. Oh, uh, hell yeah. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure something out, but 25 years, Connie, this event, that's what just sunk in, uh, last night reading through the research before I went to bed. So had a lot of fun today, pal. Awful lot. I did too. Greatly appreciate all you guys do to support us. Uh, tell your friends about my world, your new favorite wrestling podcast. Uh, I think, uh, even the staunchest critics of old double J are loving the show and we appreciate all the feedback we get. Love to see Love to hear it. Good, bad, or ugly. And, uh, we'll see you next week right here on my world. Peace.